Hey, what's going on, everybody? Hi, and welcome to the show. It is Tuesday, and that means uh, it is once again time for the Jeff Gerstmann Show. Uh, I am uh, sitting in the chair this week. My name is Jeff Gerstmann. I'm uh, happy to be here with you this time. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk and we're going to go around the world, around the world in video games. The fastest podcast in the West, the the, the, the three hours of madness. No, I don't know. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Uh, we're here uh, once again to uh, reconvene and, uh, to, you know, discuss uh, the... Discuss the discuss the matters of the day. Talk about some of the things that's been happening. It's uh, someone in chat says it's cold. Yeah, I know it's. Uh, it was it was uh, forty nine degrees last night. Oof. Out here. No, I don't know. It's uh, yeah, it seems seems like it's fucking terrible, man. Yeah. Um. I can't remember the last time I've I saw snow. Uh, the 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 dance hall uh, slash rap Canadian uh, or or actual snow on the ground. Um, man, where I I was it? I, there was that time it took me twenty four hours to get home from Las Vegas because of all the. That couldn't be the last time I saw snow. I don't know. I don't know. I honestly, uh, I could probably count on these fingers that I have here, what's left of them, um, how many times I have ever been, uh, how, how many times I have ever seen snow. Yeah, some of those trips to Boston, there was some snow there. Uh, but if we count like a trip to Boston as one instance of snow and not, uh, you know, every day I was there or, or whatever, then, then yeah, I've probably been in a snowy environment fewer than 10 times. I mean, actually, you know, I'm going to say I'm going to revise that up a little bit to maybe more like a 15 or something like that. My grandparents lived in Oregon. We would go up there for Christmas, and it would snow in southern Oregon um, sometimes. And... uh yeah, I don't know, but I, I, I don't know. It's been seven years, six years since I've been in snow. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I like snow, but I, that's, uh, that's a like that someone who, that someone who isn't, uh, in a dire amount of snow. That's, that's what someone who isn't in a dire amount of snow would say, would say snow is cool, but yeah, um, sounds like it's, uh, pretty rough out there. In some, uh, yeah, like a, yeah, like informer, sure, but also like a, you know, was it like a lonely, mon uh, when, was it lonely Monday morning, which kind of has half the same lyrics as informer, um, but is a totally different song. Uh, that one's all right too. The rest of the snow catalog, not a fan. The debut album, the, the his his uh, his big uh, his big record, uh, is it eighteen inches of snow, twelve inch, twelve inches of snow, I believe is called. Um, I'm hearing a buzz. I'm hearing a buzz. You hear the buzz? That can only mean the cable is doing something weird. Man. Fixed it. I had to yank on the, the XLR cable. It was probably touching some, uh, touching a power line. It was probably crossing a power cable, but I, I yanked on the XLR cable and now it's fine. I need to tape that up. I was going to buy some gaffers tape and, uh, and start taping, uh, taping cables to, to things. But, uh, I have not done that yet. I probably should do that. Uh, I, I you know, I, I gaff in my spare time. You know, a little bit here and there. Um, I made a purchase. This is my this is my purchase of the. I'm not gonna say purchase of the week, but for some reason, I got it in my head that I wanted one of these. It's a Sega Saturn Pro controller from Retrobit, um, and it is a 2.4 gigahertz wireless controller. 
and uh, it is a Saturn controller that they went ahead and put extra shoulder buttons onto and analog sticks to make it uh, basically like a modern controller while still having uh, the, the look and feel of a Japanese Sega Saturn controller. Uh, the analog sticks, you can convert the controller. When you have it hooked up to a real Saturn, you can, you can hook it up to... Uh, you, can, you can configure the analog sticks to be in like uh, virtual on mode and uh, and play and play that that way which is kind of interesting. I got it. This is a really dumb roundabout way, a dumb roundabout reason to buy a controller, I suppose. Um I bought this because I was thinking about emulating N64 games. I don't want to use an N64 controller. I don't want to have to have an N64 controller laying around or go buy a USB uh, N64 controller or, or whatever, uh, because it's so useless for anything else. You know, uh, once you, once you've got one of those there, you're like, Oh, this is cool for playing N64 games for the half hour. I want to do that. And then never again. Um, and so I was looking at it and going like, well, this has six buttons on the face, which is what you need to do. The C buttons of an N64 controller plus the A and B buttons. It's got an analog stick. It's got enough shoulder buttons for me to do left and right and then use one of them as a Z button. Uh, and, uh, and, and that should work, right? And uh, I, I thought about uh, all that. Plus, it's the form factor of a Saturn controller, which would be good for fighting games and, and so on and so forth. So it has a versatility. Uh, I know there's some other companies that are making, trying to make, yeah, the, yes, the people keep bringing up the Brawler 64 which is a, a, a N64 controller in a, in a different, a slightly different configuration. I, that thing it's like, looks like an abomination, though somehow better than the N64 controller, but uh, but not as not enough versatility. Um, so I got this thing in, hooked it up, and was pretty much immediately disappointed. Um, this is something you know there there are, must be. I should look this up. Um, there must be limits to the number of buttons a device can have um, because the C and the Z button on the Saturn controller are mapped to the L and the R shoulder buttons. You can't use them separately. And so my hope of using all six of the face buttons for N64 plus having three of the four shoulder buttons to use for L, R, and Z, not possible because uh, the these two buttons are just C and Z. And so that's, that's, that's a common problem with a lot of weird third party controllers where they're just like, oh yeah, we're going to put all these buttons on it and then not tell you on the webpage that tells you all about it, that really these buttons are duplicated and, and, uh, and, and mapped in a, in a garbage ass way. Um, it's frustrating. Uh, it's, it's very, it's very frustrating. So, uh, that pretty much threw it out the window for, uh, for use on a, uh, and, and, and pu plugging it into the PC is a disaster. It can't work wired. It doesn't work wired. So I had to, there, it comes with two dongles, one that plugs directly into a real Saturn and one that's a USB dongle that is for use on other devices, but plugging it in directly wired just doesn't work. And I was like, that's miserable. That's a miserable experience that why would it, why would anyone do that? That's terrible. Um, so that's, that was incredibly frustrating. Um, so I ended up hooking it up to the mister and, um, and that's, that's probably where I will exclusively use this because it, it, it will work for most things. I have been using a Hori fighting commander, uh, which is a, a game pad that looks a lot like this, but it doesn't have analog sticks. And so I, that, that was the idea of just like, oh, well, if I get one that has analog sticks, then I could probably use it for just about everything that the mister plays. Uh, and, uh, and that would be that. And so I, uh, I ended up configuring it. And, you know, I, if you use the, the L3, the clicking in of the left stick for your N64Z trigger, which that's what they should have duplicated. The L3 and R3 should be duplicated up here, not C and Z. That's, that's a dumb move on their part, I think. Um, 
Uh, you can do it. I was playing a little uh, Mario 64 just as a test with it. And I was like, this works well enough, uh, but it's not quite enough. But it'll work for just about everything else. Um, except for, I, I actually, I, I'm probably in some kind of minority on this, but I, I don't like wireless controllers. Uh, I plug them in all the time. I hate having to dick around. I hate, I don't want to eat like the battery life conversation is such that I don't even want to think about it. I just plug it in. I just want to plug it in and, and, and that have that be that. And, uh, and so generally speaking, that's, that's certainly what I do on the PC. Um, and you know, I have pretty long cables over to the consoles if I want to do that. And, and, you know, it's just not something that I, I need to do, uh, wirelessly. So, uh, yeah, I guess the only thing, yeah, I, I, I usually am wired up for, or, or wireless for the switch. That's fine. <laughs> it's, it's just the switch, you know? Um, so I don't know this thing is, it's a bummer because it feels great. Like you want a Saturn controller to feel. You know, the D-pad and the buttons and all that sort of stuff feels awesome. It feels it feels accurate. Retrobit has made some Saturn controllers previously. Um and uh and and so this is just a you know a different version of that. But the the D-pad feels as good as you want it to. The sticks, the throw on them's a little short, they're a little small. They are Hall Effect sticks, which is nice. And the triggers, the 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 triggers are not analog, so if you wanted to use them use this on a uh, device and have analog triggers. That's not an option uh, either. But uh, yeah, it's the Sega Saturn Pro controller uh, from Retrobit. Um, you know, it's like 50 bucks. You know, kind of average price for, for something like this. Like, it's okay. I was hoping it would meet more of the needs uh more, more of, more of the needs, uh, that I had, uh, than it does, if that makes any sense. So, um, yeah, that's that controller. It's, uh, I'll keep using it with the mister. I've been using the mister a lot more lately. I'm kind of messing around more and more with some of the video settings that they've added to it. Uh, like it, it had been a long time since I had kind of really messed with it. Uh, and, and really updated and, and why well, I updated, but you know, but the, the, they've added new video options since the last time I messed around with the configuration on it and, um, it'll do HDR now, which I, it's, it's the sort of thing that when you hear it, when someone says it out loud, it doesn't initially register as something that makes sense to me. Uh, where you're like, oh, you can have HDR for all of your old games. I'm like, well, none of those games support HDR. What the fuck are we talking about? What, uh, why would you, what, what are we like? What are you faking HDR? What are we? And, and, but no, it turns out, you know, CRTs and the way that they, they looked back then was, a, you know, the higher potential brightness and all of that sort of stuff. So adding HDR into the mix actually, um, is, is pretty neat. Uh, it, it, it only uses a weird type of HDR that is actually really hard to capture. And so that's sort of frustrating. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, having the, the, yes, some of the extra contrast and stuff like that does, does make a, a bit of a difference. And now it's, it's, uh, spitting, I have it configured to spit out kind of native resolution, um, for, the original consoles and arcade games and cores and stuff like that. And and then my TV is actually able to just handle those and, and scale those um, as it sees fit, which is actually working quite well. And, uh, and the combination of those two things has been um, it's, it's been, it's been very nice. Like it, it's that stuff's looking better all the time. And I think the other day, uh, over the, oh, let's say over the last week or so since hearing this news, I have been slowly talking myself into buying a RetroTINK 4K. Um, which is a scaling device that people will use for old, uh, you know, old, old consoles. It's, it's the, you know, you've probably heard, uh, heard me and others talking in, in varying degrees about a lot of these devices, whether it's another retro tink or whether it's like the, the OSSC, the open source scalar skate and the OSSC pro, um, you know, there are a handful of different devices that, that do this, but basically the idea is that it's going to take, uh, yes, open source scan converter, right? Yeah. Sorry. Um, 
that it's going to be able to handle, you know, what, whatever you're plugging into it, whether it's, uh, you know, it, it'll take composite, it'll take S video, uh, it will take SCART cables, which is why you have people out there trying to mod consoles to have RGB outputs because then they can have SCART out and plug that SCART into the, and that's the cleanest signal you can get out of these old consoles uh, and, and all of that sort of stuff, which is funny because, you know, it's like a lot of these consoles are so well emulated that at some point, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to get that clean of output out of one of these systems, you might as well just emulate it because <laughs> the signal chain is so clean that it just looks, you know, it's like, oh, look at all these pixels and lack of scan lines and all this other stuff. And so part of what all these devices do is they are also devices that will layer on scan lines and layer on different effects to try to better emulate the look and feel of a CRT. Um, I have not been really happy with a lot of the scan line options on a lot of devices, whether it's the, the Mr. itself or even the, um, the retro tink, uh, five X that I have now, um, this stuff just hasn't, hasn't really been, hasn't really been fantastic. It sounds like the retro tink 4k steps it up in a big way around all of that stuff. Um, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's expensive though. That thing is $750, but like the people that are, uh, uh, old TV weirdos that are weirdos about old TVs that are just like, have collections of old TVs. Some of them are now, you know, they're getting their hands on the, the retro tink 4k and saying like, Oh, this is, I should, I can get rid of all these CRTs. Now we don't need them anymore because of the, the quality of the image output and the quality of the filters and options that this, this thing has. It, we were there. This is now. This is now the thing that you can use to, uh, you know, basically recreate the CRT experience. And uh, I think that's incredible. I think that's amazing that we're we're finally at a point with that. Um. And uh, and so I I'm thinking about it. There's one specific feature that kind of tipped me over because you know I have a couple of devices that have SCART cables on them. Um. Like, uh, I have a Saturn down there that's, uh, that, that, uh, will, will spit out SCART. I've got a, a PC engine duo, uh, that has been modded to spit out SCART. I've got a Neo Geo around here that'll do it. Um, but even, you know, S video sources, like even the CDI, which I, I got the, We'll talk about the CDI in a minute. Uh, the CDI will spit out S video. Uh, if you have a PAL CDI, it actually has an RGB. It has a SCART connector on it. And so that's what you, you probably really want if you're going to be super fucking weird. Um, but anyway, S video plugging into the, even this, this older retro tank spit out to a TV looks amazing. Like the signal quality is, is fantastic. Um, I also have a, a VCR here that I, I want to capture some tapes. And, you know, really there's a better way to capture tapes, but that's a, another, that's a whole separate rabbit hole of uh, modifying a VCR to get better output out of it, which sounds fascinating and I would love to do it, but I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a solderer. I'm not a soldering iron sort of person. Um, and so that's, that's sort of a, that's, that's another level of, of crazy. Um that I would love to get into because I do have a lot of weird videotapes that I, I just want to capture at the highest quality possible and then throw away, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, th there's just a lot of, uh, you know, low quality third generation dupes of like eighties pornography that should probably be captured in the highest quality possible. Right. Um, anyway, uh, having all of these devices is, is, is fun and neat and, and getting them on. But like the thing that actually pushed me over the edge is a compatibility setting that they added specifically for the mister. Um, the mister can do analog out. Now it can do it a few different ways. Um, the, the way people are doing it these days is they've got an HDMI converter. It's sending basically a different signal out of the HDMI port than standard HDMI. And then you get an adapter and you use that to plug it into, you know, your CRT or your monitor or, or, or whatever. Um, but what people are doing is, is now they're taking that mister in the, in that kind of 
analog mode, plugging it into the the RetroTINK 4K, and now the updated firmware on the ret and the RetroTINK 4K basically it's getting metadata from the mister as to what the what video needs it has like here's the resolution here's all the other information you need about how to crop it how to do this and so basically you can load up a mister core and push one button on the retro tink and it will scale it and do all the other shit that it needs to do boom done you won't have to set up a bunch of presets and do all this other stuff you just hit the aux one button and it it's done and i'm like oh man that sounds amazing um, so that's, that's the thing that is now I'm, now I'm looking at it going like, now it covers enough different use cases that maybe I could justify $750 for this thing. Uh, well, they've always, you know, th that stuff's all been kind of expensive over the years. This is a new level of expensive, but like when you, when you break down what that retro tank 4k does and what it does compared to previous generations of this technology, of scan converters and scalers and all this other stuff. Like we're a long ways away from busted up weird super guns and messes of cables and all this, all the other wild shit that people used to use. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it, it sounds like a pretty incredible device. And, uh, that makes me want to try it out. They're out of stock right now. They, uh, they came out in December and, um, uh, they're supposed to restock uh, sometime this month, but it sounds like they're waiting on a, a last bit of a uh, handful of parts to to build them before they start taking orders again. But if I'm around a computer and they're back in stock and they seem like they're moving fast, I might just go eh! and uh, and and pick one up. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it seems very cool. Um, and then I didn't even get into black frame insertion, which I don't even know what that is. I don't know what BFI is or it, or what it does, or if this TV even does it, I'm not sure why you'd use it. There are still mysteries to be uncovered, uh, for, for me anyway, I don't know. Like it's, I, I feel like I'm not well versed in any of this technology and then I describe it to people and, and then with the blank looks on their faces, I go like, Oh, I guess I, yeah, I guess I'm fucking, I guess I, I guess I do know some fucking weird shit about this. Huh? Um, I saw some people saying, uh, cause we, you know, we're, we're on the other end of CES and, uh, you know, all the new OLED TVs got announced and, and everything. Um, I saw some talk that this year's, higher end LG OLEDs are actually not, maybe not as good for games or not as good for PC use as some of the previous, um, as some of the, uh, as, as some of the previous models are, I guess. Um, I don't really know what to make of that. Um, for people that are using OLED TVs with their PC and all that sort of stuff. But, um, but there are also way more OLED monitors now, so maybe that's a better option for people that are that just want to do PC stuff. But I, I basically have everything that's plugged into this TV configured to think it's a PC uh, to avoid overscan and and all that other stuff. Like I I have every single thing set to to to, to think it's a PC. Uh, anyway, I suppose that all leads us to the news. Foam stars. Foam stars is out in three weeks. The three week countdown to foam stars is on. And they've announced some release details for it. It is going to launch as a PlayStation plus game. Uh, and for its first month, it will be on PlayStation plus, And then afterwards it will be $30. Um, which is, I suppose, a reasonable price. Uh, the, the price of $0 is much nicer, <laughs> you know, uh, but 30 is, I think when everyone played that game back in June, everyone was like, this can't be full price. Maybe they could get away with 25 or 30, but, eh. um, 
You need a PS5 now. I th you know, so I believe Foam Stars. I mean, Foam Stars is also on the PlayStation Four, if I uh, remember correctly. So, um, so you you might not need to upgrade to a PS5 now. But if you want maximum foam, you'll probably want a PS5. I don't know. Um, that game seems potentially interesting. I am my, I, I am somewhat excited to play it. <laughs> um, and uh and we'll see how it does you know it's gonna you're you're gonna you're gonna find out real quick if people are sticking to that game right that's kind of the other you know as, as a multiplayer focused game if you're not familiar with foam stars uh probably the direct comparison that w is, is easy and and not completely accurate but at least kind of gets you in the right frame of mind is it is splatoon-esque Except instead of painting an arena, you are shooting foam everywhere and you can kind of surf on the foam. And then from there, it's a hero shooter. You pick different characters that have different ults and different, you know, like the, the it sort of has that mentality to it. But it is that kind of like smaller arena, like a Splatoon game, like that's that style, uh, that size. Um, and it seems neat. I don't I. I can't sit here and tell you that that game is going to be a success. I think this is the right move. Like launching on PlayStation Plus is the right move for them um, because it helps them get it into as many hands as possible. And if you're launching a multiplayer game, especially one that's, you know, it's, it's not really, it's not on people's radar. I mean, we've, this is name another podcast that has talked about foam stars the way this one has. <laughs> Maybe that I'm sure there's probably one or two more. Um, Perhaps uh, video games chronicle video games chronicles podcast has has maybe talked about it. I don't know. They they have a, a they have a number of articles about it today uh, because they they played some chunk of it. I don't know if they did a, a UK thing or what, what happened there, but um, but from uh, that reporting over there at VGC, they uh, it sounds like that uh, the next year of Foam Stars content is planned out. Um, and also, they have they have delved into the dark arts. They are using Mid Journey to make uh, a handful of small AI art. Sounds like they have used it for album covers for the they they generated fake album covers for the soundtrack, and they used Mid Journey for that. Um, and so, uh, if you remember, at the beginning of the year. Square issued its like annual like here's what's going on this year, and they're like we think AI art is we think AI is uh, gonna be a big deal and we gotta uh, we gotta make something happen we gotta uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into that and uh, it turns out they are getting into that um so yeah I, I don't know like it's the look I think for me the solution to all of the hand wringing around this specific, eh, maybe not the solution, but I think I, I would feel a whole lot better about all of this stuff. Um, if the, if, if a lot of these models hadn't been trained on copyrighted material, I think that's the, you know, when you see the New York times suing open AI and all that sort of stuff, I look at it and go, yeah, when you see open AI getting out there and saying, well, it, we, we couldn't exist if we didn't train it on, on copyrighted material, then you look at it and go like, okay, yeah, that's okay. So you, I mean, I hate to be sitting here like, you know, feeling like I'm on the side of copyright law because motherfucker, I am not. Uh, but in, uh, in this specific situation with what you're doing and the way you're using it, uh, yeah, well, maybe you should have thought of that. You're like, oh, we got to break a bunch of laws to make this. Yeah, cool, man. You have to break a bunch of laws to make a sawed off shotgun also. Uh, but no one's going like, well, I had to have, I needed it. How am I going to rob this bank? Um, and so when all these settlements happen, I, uh, I look forward to getting my like 19 cents from some settlement someday. When they go, oh yeah, we, we, we trained on your work too. Except I probably won't get it. The company that owns that work will probably get it. So like I said, copyright law is, a, copyright law is fucking terrible. That's been some of the frustrating thing about, you know, seeing people that are like, that are very against a lot of this AI stuff. Um, come across in ways where they're backing up United States copyright law, which is a fucking, which is garbage. 
uh, which is absolute trash. <laughs> uh, and so putting people in a, in a mode where they feel they are to, like need to defend the U S copyright law. That's, that's a bad, that's a bad situation anyway. Um, so I think that's anyway, that's my long winded way of saying, I think that that's the, you know, when, when that sort of stuff does get solved, when they do figure out whether it's their licensing content to make their models or they're doing, you know, like just make all this shit above board and make it on the up and up. I know that's easier to say than it is to do obviously, but, um, I think uh, that kind of solves a lot of this stuff. Then it just becomes another tool, right? And then it's like, okay, are you okay with these sorts of tools being used? I mean, you know, tools improve all the time. Um, and I wonder if we'll get there. Or or I, I wonder what will happen. If we will get there and people will make their clean, you know, their clean implementations of these LLMs or, or whatever else they're, they're making, or w instead, will they just find a way around it to go like, no, it's cool that we stole all this shit. Fuck off. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and what does that do to copyright law when someone gets busted for downloading something and appropriating it? Um, is there a way we can, do we end up backdooring this in such a way where, okay, because open AI stole all this shit and, uh, and in court set a precedent here, now you can sample whatever record you want. Fuck off. <laughs> you know? Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's the upside. I don't know. Uh, Plunder Phonics is legalized uh, along the way. Then, then we'll see. Um, also in new game announcements, Smite 2 was announced. I guess they had something called the Smite World Championships. I didn't know. I didn't realize that Smite was uh, was like that to have a World Championships. Anyway, um, they're making a second one. It sounds like uh, that they are trying to maintain the feel of the first game and try to not fuck it up. But also, they they are not going to have. Like your, it sounds like purchases won't carry forward in a, in a major way. It'll be like, oh, if you played Smite One, we'll get you something, but but it's not going to be feature parity one to one from one from the first game to the second. Uh, I, this led to me downloading Smite and walking through the tutorial because I don't think I had played Smite since Smite originally launched. I think I played it on an Xbox. Was that an Xbox 360 game or was that Xbox One? I forget when it was, but. Uh, anyway, Smite 2 is, you know, they're making another action-y, MOBA-y kind of thing, which uh, appeals to a certain crowd of people. Smite seems like the one that won out, you know? Epic had theirs that that uh, that is now coming back and with a different name or whatever the hell. But, um, but Smite seems like the one that won out the action MOBA wars of 20XX, whenever that was, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, whatever. Uh, they're moving to Unreal Engine 5. Um, and, uh, and doing the damn thing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. People liked, oh man, I keep wanting to say artifact, but, uh, the, the Epic, the Epic action MOBA that Epic made, it was not called artifact. It's called something now it's called like an ascendant or so. Yeah. Paragon. That's what it is. Paragon, Paragon, Paragon. I played a couple of matches of that and was like, okay. Like playing a few matches of Paragon probably actually helped me understand the goals of a MOBA, if that makes any sense. Um, like it was just a little more hands on, a little more like, okay, this is in a format that I'm, you know, moving the character more directly and doing all this sort of stuff. And okay, like I understand the the the, the basics of how we're pushing these lanes and doing this and that. I and then and then I realized I this is cool. I just I just don't want to do this. And, uh, and that was that. Yeah. Monday night combat like that. Yeah. There was a handful of games that were like pursuing the, like, Hey, people really like Dota and fucking uh, heroes of new earth or, you know, whatever MOBAs were around back when they made these decisions. And then a lot of companies decided around the same time to go like, what if we made a third person shooter version of this? Um, and then it could be on consoles and, and and so on and so forth. It's a great idea. It makes a ton of sense. And I, you know, Smite seems like it's probably doing well quietly over there off to the side, probably doing quite well for high res. Uh, are they, yeah, they've high res had a number. Yeah. Anyway, 
um, they are looking to at least get it out in some kind of alpha or some kind of thing you'll be able to get your hands on uh, before too long here. So, um, so yeah. Uh, also in the, well, not every game gets to ship. Smite 2 will probably ship. According to Eurogamer, Project Tatanka has uh, potentially been canceled. Um, that is uh, according to uh, Eurogamer is wrapping up a couple of different, uh, like an Xbox podcast and a couple of other people that have been saying the same thing. Project Tatanka was uh, supposedly, uh, well, that was, it was certain affinities Halo game. And it was rumored to have started as a battle Royale. Um, I'm holding out for project repo man or like a project, the Quebecers or, you know, like some other sort of thing like that. As much as, as much as we love Tatanka, as much as, as much as we love Tatanka for his appearance in the hit film, uh, natural born killers, even though it was just footage of him in the ring on a screen while Rodney Dangerfield yelled, um, that when I, when I think about Tatanka, I think about natural born killers. <laughs> um, that that's where I'm at. Anyway, uh, you know, it had never really been announced, but certain affinity had been talking about like, oh yeah, we're kind of working on something bigger that is halo related or whatever. And certain affinity, I guess had been contributing to halo in a handful of ways. Um, but this is something that they, again, according to Eurogamer, you know, is wrapping all this up. It had been in the works for over two years with like a hundred people working on it. Um, and yeah, that, that's what it was. That was okay. There was a, a from certain affinity said that they were deepening its relationship with the three, four, three, and that they had been entrusted with further evolving halo infinite in some new and exciting ways. And I think at the time there was talk about that, like, oh, they're making a battle Royale in, in the halo universe, which maybe made slightly more sense two years ago. The landscape being what it is now. Hmm. Eh, hmm, hmm, I don't know. That's a little, it's maybe a, maybe a, a dicier proposition in 2024 slash five um, than it is uh, then. But uh, Bloomberg did lady, later state that Project Tatanka had begun as a battle royale, but may evolve in a different directions. And now if th these reports are true, it has evolved into being canceled. Um I, I, yeah, I, I don't really know what to make of this, you know, cause it's it, at the end of the day, um, some of this, you start to wonder like, okay, what do you, what's the, what are the future goals for Halo Infinite? And I think at the, you know, that's a better, that's a better conversation now than it probably was in, in late 2022. Or, or even 2020, when the project seemed to get underway. Um, well, no, in 2020, there was no, there was not a Halo Infinite to be. Anyway, um, point being, the Halo Infinite conversation has certainly changed over the last, let's call it six to nine months, and people are quite a lot, uh, are, are, are significantly more positive about it than they have been. Um, which probably helps in a situation like this where you're like, okay, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to cancel. We're, we're, we're not going to do a battle Royale. We're not going to do whatever this other thing is. We're going to, we're going to stand by this and who knows what their long-term plans are, but like, let's stand by halo infinite for X number of additional seasons. And then you guys go over here. And the, ru the rumor was that they were taking the unreal engine and building a halo game there. Um, and so, you know, if they're going to change engines and do all this other stuff, then if certain affinity is working in the existing Halo engine, that might be super weird. And who, who knows uh, what what all that stuff, uh, if, if that stuff did end up impacting the, the project in, in any way. But uh, but those are things that potentially could have happened, I suppose. Um, I, I'm, I, I guess I would say I was casually interested in the idea of a Halo Battle Royale just because, like, what does that look like? Or, or you know, like, what do we... What is the actual future of Halo? As someone who's a, you know, I guess a, I would say a mild Halo fan, I'm not... I don't know, I'm not... I, I don't think I'm 
I don't think I'm weird about it. I don't. Insofar as there are a lot of Halo games that I don't like, <laughs> and it's the Halo games that people talk about all the time. Like, ah, yeah. Oh, you like Halo too? Great. Worst game in the franchise. Eh, hmm. Maybe second worst. Anyway, um, we'll see. We'll see what the future holds for for Halo. Um, yeah, did you, did people are like, uh, people in chat are like, what do you mean the work? Did you play, did you anyone, did anyone play the Halo 2 campaign? Did anyone happen to like, look at that? Remember, it's easy to forget now how pissed people were, uh, about Halo 2 at the time. Um, but then I caught myself and I thought about five and I was like, mm, mm. maybe five is the worst one. Maybe five is the worst one. They had that mode with the cards. It was just a. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Um. Halo Three. Now that's a goddamn video game. Have you seen this? Have you seen the Halo? Th have you have you seen this Halo Three that they got? Woo! Woo! Man, that's a <sighs> that's a game for the damn ages, right there. Um. And Reach and ODST was cool. Yeah, anyway, there's a mid, the mid period Halo games. How about that? The end of Bungie's run. They went out on top. Um, but yeah, what do you, you know, what do you do? What do you do with it at this point? Like, are they, they, I feel like they've at least done the work to, um, salvage Halo Infinite to where people are now speaking positively about it to where if they if they announced another Halo in a, in a year or so people would probably be ready for it and be like yeah fuck yeah as opposed to oh you're uh, you're you shit the bed last time out and now you're cutting time you know like like people would have a, a different take so good on them for kind of riding the ship on that and and hopefully it does kind of give them the leeway to um make bigger changes like yeah if they want to go with a different engine like that I think that I think that makes sense if if they were if they were hamstrung by their technology because that's I remember hearing about Halo Infinite and and for some reason whenever I think about this specific tidbit I think about the hall bathroom in my old house. I think that's where I I was walking out of there and I saw this someone sent this to me like someone basically sent me something that was like um that was like hey that like Halo Infinite is currently being built like the renderer is from fucking Reach it's like it's like super old tech like the maybe not reach, but like the, 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 they just had incredibly old tools that they were working with. And the tech debt on halo was ridiculous and they weren't fixed and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know like that, that the good on them for kind of getting it together. And, and, you know, people, people seem genuinely excited about where, uh, Halo Infinite is at these days. And so that's great. Um, speaking of Microsoft, they're going to announce or they're, they're going to show some games later this week. Um, they've got a kind of brief uh, hour long thing about a handful of games here. And they've gone ahead and just said, here's, here's what we're showing. It's not going to be some it doesn't seem like it's going to be some big announcement focused stream, but they are going to do, they're calling it developer direct, which they, I believe have done one of these before they've inserted an underscore between developer and direct because computers, <laughs> uh, they are going to show Indiana Jones, the game, uh, the upcoming game from machine games. Um, it says here they will show more than 10 minutes of game and developer insights, including details about the game's setting and story, how fans will actually play as indie, additional details from his next globetrotting adventure, and the premiere of the first gameplay trailer. So they'll have a name for it at that point. A name was getting around uh, through trademark references. What was it? Uh, it was like Indiana Jones and the Great Circle, I think is the name that's been floating around. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but... But that has been the name that has been going around for the last handful of days here. Um, machine games, uh, those Wolfenstein games were good and frustrating. They were good and not great in some cases. They were amazing from a setting perspective. And then sometimes just in, in a couple of 
spots, the gameplay got in its own way, I guess I would say. At the same time, their weird alt history whole thing that they did for that was really compelling. And I would like to see them finish that trilogy. Um, yeah, the, the second game, the second Wolfenstein was not, and then they did the VR game and the other, the other little standalone game. It's it's just just like where you're playing as, as BJ's daughters and and like all that. You're like, okay, that's, that's not, that's, that's not really doing it either. Um, I still feel like we are owed a Wolfenstein three. Um, because I, I conceptually, I think that game is certainly capable of being tremendous. I just, but that second one really kind of, really kind of fucked it all up. I wonder, you know, I mean, and now they're making this Indiana Jones game. We'll see if after this ships, will they, will they get back to Wolfenstein or has it been long enough that it's just like, ah, ah, you know, we, we took a shot. Um, But yes, we did not finish the fight, as it were. Uh, Avowed will be shown. That is uh, Obsidian's upcoming fantasy action RPG. Set in the fantastical, vibrant, living lands. Uh, They will show gameplay. And uh, they will show how Obsidian's expertise in building worlds with deep themes, dynamic gameplay, and thoughtful reactivity come to life. They will show Aura History Untold. Uh, that is from Oxide Games. Uh, and they're building them as creators behind classic strategy titles, including Civ V. They'll show some gameplay. They'll talk about some of key features and the road ahead for that game. And they will also show Senua's Saga Hellblade 2. Uh, sounds like they will visit the studio uh, at Ninja Theory. We'll give insight into how they are building that game. And then after that, a separate event. Like I this is like it's funny. Um I get it. Uh a separate event that starts right afterwards will be about uh it'll be the Elder Scrolls Online 2024 Global Reveal. It's a standalone presentation where they're un- they will unveil the next major chapter including a new zone storyline and other major features uh, coming in the, the game's biggest update this year. So like, why not just say it's a two hour developer direct, but one hour of it will. And I know why you don't do this is because the people who don't play ESO don't give a fuck about it. Uh, and, and they are not going to get back in at this point. You will, you will get some of them here and there, but it's already been on game pass. It's already been stuff like, you know, it's like, eh, you know, they, they've, they've taken their shots at, uh, at, at getting people on board with that. So now it's, it's a, they, they do the same thing around E3 where it's like, we're going to have our whole press conference and then stay tuned afterwards. We're going to do a deep dive. We're going to show elder scrolls online in a separate event for the weirdos that like that. We get it. We get it. The average audience doesn't want it. And, and they'll be mad if we waste time, waste time, quote unquote, to show it. It's just funny. Like this whole thing that they're controlling. They're like, even, even in this, they're still like, Oh, it's a se- It's a separate event for elder scrolls. It's a, after the developer direct has concluded, Zenimax will host the Elder Scrolls Online 2024 global reveal. It's a standalone presentation. Like, what does that mean? That means someone's going to show up and say, welcome at the front of it. It's a video. It's a video. Um, but I guess if you said, hey, we're doing a developer direct, it's two hours long. By the way, one hour of it is on ESO. People would be like, ugh. You know, so it's all just a weird perception thing, whatever. They they are right to do it that way. It's just funny. Uh, Ubisoft is uh, yeah. And Nirkip asks uh, says, I wonder how many times they will mention Starfield and in what capacity. I wouldn't think. I mean, they, they've said, hey, it's focused on these four games, and then there's an ESO thing afterwards. So I, I don't think that they will. This doesn't seem like the sort of event that will have like some surprises or some extra stuff mentioned. If if anything, it feels like they are very carefully laying out. Hey, here's here's what we're showing. I suppose it is always possible that they sneak some additional thing into this, but the the way they're talking about the developer direct thing, it is it is not some big reveal focused event. It's here's updates on these games. We're telling you about what these games are going to be, and we're even telling you 
what we're going to show about those specific games. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, someone said Starfield DLC. I'm like, mm. like they're pushing a beta. Like Starfield is pushing updates to a beta branch on Steam. That's where Starfield is at. So I don't think Starfield DLC would be a very fun or well received uh, announcement at this time. Also, I don't think they get out there and have a, 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 a 10 minute thing about like, here's the patches we're doing for Starfield. No, you do those quietly. And then later on you say, here's Starfield. You know, you represent Starfield later if, if you, if you want to do that, if you feel you need to do that, but it's not, it, it's any time for that. Um, lots of, yeah, you're right. Lots of games do test updates on beta branches. They're just usually not first party Microsoft games. Kind of a new thing for them. Uh, also, that's the only way you can test it. There's no option for doing that. Like, there's no insider build for Xbox or or for the Windows Store. It's like only something they're doing for people who bought it on Steam, which is also kind of fucked up. Uh, the infrastructure is there. That's why they're doing it. But um, it is sort of weird that like, hey man, you want DLSS? Oh yeah, we're testing it on this beta branch. I think that did roll out, but um. I don't think it speaks especially well of where Starfield is at, that this has been their update process of like, oh, we're going to roll out some betas so people can try it because it'll help it helps help us get it in people's hands faster. If, if they're playing these betas and doing this sort of stuff like that, it's, it's not where you, it's not where you want to be post release. It's one thing for a fighting game to be like, oh, we're testing rollout or uh, rollback. If you want to opt into this beta branch, you can test out the rollback. It's another thing to be like one of the biggest games of the year needed to do a bunch of beta branch stuff because of how much stuff it was missing. Um, Ubisoft is making some changes to its subscription service. Um, they are adding an additional tier on the PC that I guess wasn't there before. I thought this was there before, but, uh, but no. They have had uh, Ubisoft Plus multi-access and PC access, and that is changing to be called Ubisoft Premium. And they are going to now offer Ubisoft Plus Classics on PC, which is something they've offered on PlayStation as part of the higher end PlayStation Plus tiers. And I think there's an equivalent on, I think there's an equivalent on, on Xbox. I'm not positive about that, but basically it's their like, here's our day one. Um, you know, if you want day one access to all of Ubisoft's games and DLC and all that sort of stuff, they're going to charge you $17.99 a month for that. Uh, and that is, uh, that works on Xbox, PC, and Amazon Luna. Which continues to exist. Uh, there's also Ubisoft Plus Classics, which is, if you've seen the offering on PlayStation, it's, it's back catalog stuff here. The ones they're mentioning here are Far Cry 6, Rainbow Six Siege, and Watch Dogs Legion. Um, and that is $7.99 a month. And uh, Ubisoft posted a Q&A with the head of their, um, with uh, Philippe Tremblay, who is the director of subscription at Ubisoft, because uh, they've been running this for four years now. So to kind of walk through some of the changes and stuff. And it's like, it's interesting because like the questions are, like with new releases out day one, how do you hope to combat churn rates? You're like, oh, this is like a forward-facing thing, and you're asking about churn rates. That's kind of, it's kind of cool. It's weird. Uh, the answer is the goal of Ubisoft Plus is for us to build value. We've made the commitment to bring more games to our subscribers. So, looking into the future, we have an exciting lineup that they'll be able to play either in early access or on day one. For them, early access means like get it three days early, um, not like early access, Steam early access. And then it will eventually have the Activision Blizzard catalog too, alongside the perks and our rich, diverse back catalog. We believe we're offering a compelling reason for our players to stick around. Uh, and then there's no additional details on when the Activision stuff will become available. You remember that as part of the concessions that Microsoft had to make uh, in, uh, I guess, the EU, um, that they ended up kind of dealing some of those streaming rights to Ubisoft um, so that they were 
able to offer them uh, 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 on a streaming basis. Um, another little tidbit in here, one in 10 subscribers to Ubisoft Plus is someone who has never played a Ubisoft game before. Which I don't, that seems weird. Um, well, actually, maybe that's not weird. Not, that means 9 out of 10 players have. That means 90% of people signing up for for a subscription have played Ubisoft games. But, you know, at the same time, like someone just going in sight unseen and being like, I'm, I'm just going to subscribe to this thing. Look at all these games um, is, is, I suppose, interesting. Um, and they say they're above projection in terms of subscribers signing up. And on October, they reached the highest highest month since highest month since launch, in terms of monthly active users. Did Ubisoft ship a game in October? I don't actually remember. Um, I guess the crew came out around then, right? Uh, yeah, it's you know I don't know the the subscription service thing is interesting. There's only really a handful of companies that seem like they can do it. And it's, you know, Ubisoft is doing it and EA is doing it. And, you know, outside of the hardware manufacturers who are going to do way more third-party deals, um, then, uh, then, yeah. Uh, reports coming out of Eurogamer. Okay. This is, this has since been confirmed. Uh, Eurogamer reported this yesterday. Game, the retailer, the UK-based uh, video game retailer known as Game, is going to stop taking trade-ins. And they are also going to phase out pre-owned games and something called Game Elite, which is probably some kind of membership service or something like that. Uh, the statement from them says, Pre-owned will still be available in our standalone stores across the UK while stock lasts. And Game Elite will still be available until the end of summer. Um, but yeah, it looks like they're going to be phasing out, taking in trade-ins over the over next little bit here. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Game Elite is the reward program where you can earn boosted reward points with a three pounds a month subscription. Um, and then Eurogamer says that uh, this move has been prompted by the growing number of game outlets now located within sports direct stores which require a separate till that tracks the large back catalog of items the chain currently accepts for trade-ins uh and so that means they've had to have separate registers and separate cash registers and a whole separate process for selling games because of all the weird used shit and everything else so uh it, it helps them integrate into the sports direct systems a lot more cleanly um, you know, you go to sports direct, I, I, if, if it all worked together, that'd be beautiful because you could like take a bunch of PS2 games, probably do a sports direct and get what, I don't know, a lacrosse stick and some high tech silver shadows, something nice, you know, um, but this, I don't know the, the, yeah, as, as games move closer and closer to our, our, uh, nasty all digital future, I suppose it makes sense that eventually they would get out of the used game business because fewer people are buying physical games. So fewer people are selling them back used. So fewer people are, you know, that entire ecosystem is just going to die on its own. Uh, you didn't, you didn't need to launch the Xbox one as a digital only always online sort of thing to kill used games. You just needed to push the right buttons and wait and it would kill itself. Um, and so I expect that we would eventually, you know, not for the same reasons, but I, I would expect that, you know, your, your game stops and stuff like that will eventually have a harder time sourcing used games. Um, as, as physical game sales continue to decline, increasingly you'll find that the percentages of people that are still buying physical games are people that buy them for a reason and that's to keep them and so they're not going to sell them back used you'll still have the dedicated players who are just like always focused on that specific bargain though right like 
like, hey, I buy physical games because that means I can buy them used. That means I can sell them used. That means I can do that, you know. And so there are people that are, are that prefer that sort of ecosystem because just it's a way for them to play more games than they might be able to otherwise. But as games go on, I mean, the I, I got a notification yesterday, mid-January, on the like PlayStation app on my phone that said, these holiday deals aren't going to last forever. And I was like, dog, it's, it's January 15th. What the fuck are you talking to me about your holiday deals? Um, Steam has another sale going on right now. Like, you know, the, the sales and, and discounts that we see cycle through the digital storefronts are only going to be more enticing um, to more and more players as time goes on as well. Um, and yeah, you know, the, what, do you, what do you get for a physical copy of a game? You get that peace of mind that physical media comes with. Uh, you know, you get the peace of mind that you've got it on disc. Of course, it doesn't come with a cool instruction manual anymore. And half the time what's on the disc is not the final version of the game. And it's not going to be something that's in a amazingly playable state compared to where a game probably ends up after a year and a half of patches or whatever else. And so you better hope that those online servers with patches are still up or that you've archived all the patches and found a way to install those separately from the official means hmm. um at which point you won't need the disc anyway uh so yeah right i mean that that's the eventually this sort of thing while they're doing this they're, they're seemingly doing this because it helps them better integrate into whatever these sports direct stores are um You know, uh, the the trend seems like it's going to continue to move in this direction. And not it's not a 2024 thing, and it's probably not a 2025 thing. You know, like the, whenever we get new consoles, and I don't, I don't mean like pro consoles. I mean, whenever there's like Gen 6 consoles, hmm. Um, I feel like there's a, you know, there's a high probability that a PlayStation 6 still has a disk drive on it. I don't know. unless things change pretty rapidly worldwide for bandwidth and for all of that other stuff. Um, I think there will still be a reason to put out a game on disc. Um, but maybe at that point they do move to the, Hey, also you always have to have internet and we're basically the disc is going to have whatever data we had ready by the time those discs needed to be pressed. And you're going to need to be connected to the internet and you're going to enter a serial number that actually is effectively a digital purchase. Um, and, and anyone can use the disc. They just won't have the license to play it. Uh, unless they also have the serial number or something like that. The way PC games used to be decades ago before they went all digital. Um, no one, no one seems to be lamenting the lack of physical media on the PC, but the PC being such an open platform that you're just like, fuck it, I can download it. Um, perhaps alleviated um, much of those concerns. I have a bunch of physical PC games. It's, it's you know, in the garage and they're ridiculous. I, I love the art. I, I love the... I don't know if you know this about me. Jeff Gersman here. To say, I love the art. And I love the big weird boxes. I love the big weird trapezoid shaped Tomb Raider boxes, even though I don't like Tomb Raider. That's how much I like the art. I like the big weird World of Warcraft special editions and their big wide boxes. I like the big weird boxes, but then they got rid of all the big weird boxes and they went to things that were the same basic size and shape as a DVD case. And uh, that's less cool. It's still got art. There's still art. The art still exists, but I don't know. Quake 3 came in a fucking metal fucking box. Not like a steel case like, oh, here's a bonus. It was just like, no, this is Quake 3, motherfucker. It's coming in a big metal box. You're like, oh, shit. 
<sighs> but yeah, b big box PC games. Those were the days. Um, those were cool. And ridiculous, because you'd open it up and there'd be like two pieces of paper inside and a CD and a serial number. And then you would take all of that stuff, put it in, stick it into a PC and then throw it somewhere and maybe never use it again. Um, so I get it. Like there are, there are really good reasons why a lot of this stuff went away, you know, but, um, maybe we just need an outlet for cool art. Maybe, you know, like, Hey, we're not going to do boxed copies. Maybe that's what, how GameStop moves forward. Like they're selling Funko pops and other fucking trash all the time. Right. That people just fucking stick on a shelf. Why not just be like, hey, man, do you want a cool uh, metal? Uh, it's just a sheet of metal that says Quake 3 on it, and then you could nail it to your wall, and then you could look at it and go, fucking Quake 3, dude. Maybe they just need to sell cool shit like that. <laughs> the, the reason I bought vinyl, even though I didn't have a record player, were, were two reasons. One, oftentimes they came with a digital digital download code. And two, I like cool art. But then I never did anything with it. I bought like the last Daft Punk record on vinyl thinking like, oh, that'd be cool. I could put it on my wall. I could be one of those guys that gets the fucking, the things for walls that hold records. And then I could put a bunch of records in it. Did, did I do that? No. But I, I bought all that shit. And if I ever get a record player, I would have one. I wouldn't use it because like, what? Are you, it's, it's Daft Punk's last record. I've got fucking nine copies of it sitting around here somewhere, as well as whatever streaming service versions of it that you want to listen to at any given time. So it's, you know, I I buy music that is harder to find, I guess, at this point, or or that I'm personally interested in. For uh, I got a copy of Ed Kale, uh, Kaloff's Mo Grooves sitting over here. I bought it on vinyl. Ed Kale obviously did the, the Price is Right soundtrack. The mute, the, the theme. It did a bunch of great TV themes over the years. I set it on a shelf over here. And then this CDI up here pressed up against it and bent the goddamn record. So now all it is is art. <laughs> it's cool yellow vinyl. Unfortunately, it's now bent like a goddamn yellow ass banana. That's my fuck up. I just wanted to have art. I just wanted to have cool art. Anyway. I keep thinking I should buy a record player. But then. So, I was looking at mini disc players last night. Like rack mounted. Like go in a stereo system go in a cabinet mini disc players. Cause they're like a dollar. Like if you, if you go on buy, if you go look on, on uh, Yahoo auctions, Japan, uh, those, all that shit is dirt cheap. Cause it's all just like filthy. The exchange rates really good right now. Uh, there's a, there's a ton of them there. And you can get used blank mini discs for relatively cheap these days as well. Um, I do have I have a portable a portable mini disc player already um, that was used for hip hop purposes for some years. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like I, I'm I'm I feel like the exchange rate and all of this SCART talk we were doing earlier. I found myself spending about forty five minutes last night looking at. PC 88 hardware on Yahoo auctions. Um, specific, specifically like an 8801 Mark II FR or MR, or whatever. There's a, a specific range of them that are going to be the right model to play Super Mario Brothers special on. And you can get the computer. I could probably get a computer that I think works for about 150 bucks. In some cases, the keyboard to use with it would cost more. However, the only copies of Super Mario Brothers Special that I can currently find online 
are people on eBay. One guy is selling it for $800 and there was another copy on there for $1,600 plus. And I really want to be able to play Super Mario Brothers Special in its most accurate form. But that is too much money for a copy of that game. So yes, someday I will probably have to just go to Japan and source one locally and see if I can find one for less. But that's, uh, you know, yes, uh, I would love to do all of that sort of stuff. The, the kids are a little young right now for me to do a ton of traveling, but that's uh, on the long-term list. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's it's the sickness. It's the sick, like the, the thinking about buying that retro tink and then being like, well, that would be a way for me to hook a lot of things up to a TV. I wonder if I could hook a, a PC 88 up to it. Hmm. I bet I could. I mean, it's got RGB out. I bet I could do this. I bet I could blah, 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 blah. And, and I bet I could jump through all those hoops and get a working, a working PC 88. But that, that's that's way too much money. I refuse to spend that amount of money on a copy of Super Mario Special. That's insane. That's a that's a, a broken a broken brain sort of uh, maneuver right there. Uh, the question: Could a new one hooked up hook up to it? Yes, a new one. I mean, a new one hooks up to an old TV, an old NTSC TV. So presumably, a new one is either going to have S video or component out. And the RetroTink has both S video and component in. Um, so yes, a, a new on probably would work just fine on it. I've got the replacement drive belt for this CDI. And then I went and looked. I thought I had videos of, of people replacing drive belts on a CDI, but I can't like they're all for different models. Now that I'm looking at them closely, I'm like, oh, that's not the one I have. Oh, shit. And so at some point I'm going to have to find my Torx screwdriver because it has Torx screws in it for some dumb reason. And I'm going to have to bust the CDI open and see what I can do. And if I break it, then I send it to someone to get fixed. And I try to get an ODE installed in it along the way, which I, which is the end game anyway. Um, anyway, layoffs continue. Uh, Lost Boys Interactive, which was a studio uh, that Gearbox purchased, uh, has lost uh, what Eurogamer is referred to as a sizable portion. Um, Aftermath originally reported on this. And then, yeah, uh, Lost Boys confirmed the layoffs with Eurogamer and saying, yes, that, that did definitely happen. Uh, Lost Boys helped out on... Uh, the Tiny Tina game. They also helped out on Diablo 4 and and did some Borderlands 3 work also. I guess probably before they got acquired, they were on Diablo 4 to to some degree. Um, so yeah, some some more layoffs there. Some more Embracer-related layoffs. Um, I saw someone in chat saying it earlier, and it's a fair... I suppose it's a fair point to make. Remember all of Embracer's talk about game preservation and setting up a library and preserving game history? I think with all of the acquisitions and now layoffs, they have probably done more damage to more different operations, more different studios than, I mean, fuck man, probably even, I was going to say, who, who is the, who's the, who's done it the worst? And I was like, oh, right. EA gets the rap for when they bought origin and then when they bought Bioware and all, you know, be like, oh, EA buys things and ruins them. Embracer is gunning for that title in a much more direct and, and fucked up way. Now that, uh, now that I think about it. Um, and lastly, Stalker 2 has been delayed until uh, later this year. It was originally supposed to ship uh, earlier in 2024. Uh, they are now saying the final release date for Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl is now September 5th, 2024. Um, this is a long post to Twitter. And uh, 
it's a very long winded. Uh, the, 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 they're like, uh, okay, like, then they finally get to it. On the technical side of things, the game needs more time. Throughout the for the frankly challenging development process, we understood the time was of the team's main essence, seeing the scope of polishing and understanding that we can't push your patience too much. We were absolutely dedicated to releasing in Q1. And we worked extra hard to meet the release window. But at the beginning of this year, we still witnessed the certain amount of technical imperfections that hold Stalker 2 below the expected standards for the final experience our fans are waiting for. Um, and so, yeah, they're they're delaying until September. I, I don't know that I knew that they had gotten out there with that Q1 date to begin with. I thought they were floating with a little more... You know, because obviously the the developers have been in a crazy situation for a long time, um, and so that's a that's a little rough. Um, but but yeah, uh, September for Stalker Two is is what they are saying is now the final release date. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. It's crazy. I, I for how long Stalker Two has been in development and all that sort of stuff. Like, oh man, yeah, right. And this is actually kind of a crazy, crazy road for them. I mean, you know, forget about the the you know, well, not that you can. I was gonna say forget about the forget about the world turmoil that is certainly the backdrop and getting in the way of all of this stuff um, for them over there. But uh, but yeah, rough by any standards. Um, and hopefully they'll get it to uh, the right point by September, and uh, and we'll see how it all comes out. That's the news. What do you say we get into some emails? Hmm? Let's take a brief break, and then we'll be back with some emails. Okay, we're back. Hi. Uh, let's get into some emails right now. Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. You can send them in. Send them in, fool. Um, let's see here if there's any more new emails that have come in here. And, uh, and we'll get into it. Um, let me look at the dates here so I can start in the right spot. And so on and so forth. Michael from Indianapolis writes in and says, A couple of years ago, Konami held the Action and Shooting Game Contest to give indie developers a shot at reviving their dormant IPs by entering in design pitches. These aren't IPs like Silent Hill or Metal Gear. Franchises included Gradius, uh, Bio Miracle, uh, Yar Kung Fu, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Contestants could win 2 million yen. $18,000 then, but now $14,000. But if the winner wanted to commercialize their game, Konami, uh, the, 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 the reward was more substantial. Uh, Konami would pledge 30 million yen, or $270,000, supervisor assistance, production assistance, localization support, promotion, and development resources. This feels like a big win-win for everyone involved. Konami gets buzz and a new game released under their banner and an indie dev gets some experience and work with an established franchise and the gamers get a new twin B. My question is what company do you think would benefit the most from a competition like this? And if you could pick any company to have their IPs revived in this way, who would it be? I guess like my, my first actual question here is did anything come of this? You know, were any games actually um produced under this program under this contest because the thing i'll say is that the idea of giving a developer eighteen thousand dollars or even i mean honestly two hundred and seventy thousand dollars and some production support doesn't sound like a a, a game that is going to ship and is going to be it's going to matter right um and so a lot of the uh, the games on these on these lists are you know it, it's a bunch of weird Konami IPs that you know you don't well not all that weird I mean Gradius is on here um you know Twin B the Star Soldier games because Konami owns Hudson um Yar Kung Fu is never you know that that thing's never 
uh, going to go anything. The Magic Castle Legend series. I'm not actually sure. This is a really small image, so I'm not positive what that uh, what that is. Um, but yeah, the the amount of money they were offering at the time even seemed like. Um, insultingly low so, so if you were a developer that had any actual experience like the idea of entering a contest or something like that seems really weird so I, I just I wonder I wonder who entered this and um if anything ever came of it because it I it doesn't it just doesn't seem that doesn't, that doesn't seem like enough money to get a game made at any sort of scale where it's like even going to ship on like, oh, it's on Steam and the Switch or something like that. Like that, that just seems like it, it, it's something for, yeah, amateur programmers or uh, any sort of like, oh, we held a contest and you you came up with a good idea for a ER Kung Fu game. Here's some money. And then it never gets made um, because all you had to do was come up with the idea. And, and so I, I did... That whole contest seemed very strange when it first happened a couple of years ago. I do remember this and, and feeling really weird about it at the time and now revisiting it here in 2024. So it's like, oh, yeah. Did anyone even make any games as a result of this? Or was it just someone just wrote up a document and said, what if you, are, what if you took made a fighting game? What if you made a modern fighting game out of Yee Kung Fu? That'd be sick. And that's the whole, that's what I, I would have written that on a paper. And then I would have cut out a picture of the nunchuck guy, who I believe his name was Nuncha, and pasted it on the paper real nice. And then I would have handed it in and said, give me $18,000. And they would have said, you're right, it is a good idea. We should make a fighting game. Anyway, here's your eighteen grand. I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't, that, that whole thing seemed like a just ill-conceived or, or, or just like a fan contest, not like an actual like development sort of thing. Um, anyway, the question is if you could pick any company to have their IPs revived this way, who would it be? And my answer is to have them revived this way. No one, I wouldn't, you know, it, it's absolutely no one because none of these games came to pass. Uh, it resulted in as far as we can tell zero actual developed and shipped games. Uh, so yeah, no, but if, if I, if I could have a company's IPs sourced out to actual proven indie developers and, and all that sort of stuff, it'd be Nintendo. It's always Nintendo, you know, uh, it's always like, man, what if you got someone who really wanted to make a sick new kid Icarus game, you know, like, oh, what if, what if you really wanted to have, uh, you know, someone make a brand new cool urban champion game, you know, like, like all of the weird Nintendo IPs that are, are dormant. You know, it's like someone, someone out there is sitting on a killer idea for a Doshin the giant fucking sequel. And they should be allowed to make it. There was a report not that long ago saying that Nintendo was talking to more external developers about some of its IP and that maybe they were, they were thinking about this sort of stuff, but yeah, Magic Carpet Software, the makers of Stroker for the Commodore 64. I want to see their IPs revived in a modern context. I want to see their their IPs. I want them to see to see them be re-erected. Um Matthew in Bristol writes in my office took us out for our Christmas party to a new arcade bar that opened up in our city a few months ago. We got a bunch of free tokens and we were let loose on the machines. It was a big place spread across three floors. As I walked around, I noticed a Mr. Do cabinet. Having heard you sing its praises over the years and watched you play it on stream multiple times, I decided to give it a try. Turns out you're right. Mr. Do kicks ass. See? It's, I, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does. Get the Universal Catalog. And make a new Mr. Do. Make a new Mr. Do Adventure, the rumored Mr. Do Laserdisc game. Bring that back. Anyway, I died on the second level. To my surprise, the game asked me to enter my name as I had just gotten the high score. When entering my name, I realized it was the only one on the leaderboard. It made me incredibly sad to think this poor Mr. Do machine had been sat there for months 
with no one playing it, I ended up pumping a bunch more tokens into it and also put a couple of uh, JEFs onto the leaderboard in your honor. Long live Mr. Do. Yeah. Yeah, I think even by like retro arcade standards, uh, you probably you just you don't see a lot of Mr. Do machines out there. And when you do, they're not always given the uh, the best. Uh, they're not always the most remembered game. Uh, you know, people going to your Pac-Mans and your Dig Dugs. Um. It also, it's entirely possible that they turn the machines on fresh every morning and uh, and the, it doesn't save the scores. That's It's probably more likely what happened. But also, I would believe that a Mr. Doom machine sat for months with no one playing it. That's also, that's a, that's a very, especially in a three-story retro arcade, I feel like that's a very believable outcome. Ryan from Austin writes in and says, what's your favorite Vegas activities? <sighs> my favorite thing to do in Las Vegas is get the fuck out. Um, the, uh, I, the, the, I know the pinball museum or whatever there, uh, was falling onto hard times. I don't know if it's still, but the, the Las Vegas pinball hall of fame is pretty neat. Uh, last time, my wife and I went, we rented a car and, uh, drove into, the, we drove to the Grand Canyon and saw that. That was actually kind of neat. Uh, but my favorite thing to do in Las Vegas is to eat a bunch of fucking shitty buffet food. Is to go to buffets and just like eat the world's most average prime rib or go at breakfast and, and eat the world's most average pancakes. Um, Ryan from Texas writes in and says, I just logged on to Candy Crush for the first time in a few years and got an in-game notification that I'm currently not receiving rewards from the gold tier of the Candy Crush Battle Pass. I just got to thinking if any of our parents or grandparents are subscribed to the Candy Crush Battle Pass, what a time for gaming. Yeah, a lot of mobile games are doing these types of dual reward track thing of like, Hey, we're doing a limited time event and you can get these rewards. But if you give us $20 or 750 or whatever, you'll also get the gold track of rewards. And yeah, the that's, it's not, uh, it's not new. It's not, uh, necessarily, uh, exclusive to candy crush. Uh, tap Titans two has one of those that pops up from time to time. And it's rewards are terrible. Uh, every, but every reward in mobile games is terrible because it's a reward for a mobile game. Uh, but if you're, uh, yeah, if, if you, um, if you really dig into it, you'll find games, you'll find games that have like weekly subscriptions and you're like, you get a stipend of gems and you get this bonus shit by being a, uh, and it's, it's always some ridiculous amount of money. You just look at and go like, who would fall for this? But people do, right? I mean, it's otherwise there's always some whale out there that'll fall into some subscription trap on some of that stuff. Randy in Portland, Oregon writes in and says, do you have any good personal Randy Pitchford stories? I heard he really liked inviting people to his house. Ugh. It's a terrible joke. By the way, as a Randy, I like to judge other Randys on how they rep our namesake. Pitchford is a bad Randy. I do like the phrase a bad Randy. Um, I don't. I, I've, uh, I've, I've met Randy Pitchford in, in a few different situations, but it's been a, a pretty long time. You know, it, it judges weak events and stuff. I've watched him give presentations on games. I interviewed him, uh, and spoke with him when borderlands one was, was getting off the ground. Um, we've exchanged some USB sticks and no, um, the, 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 the thing I'll say is that when a lot of the Randy Pitchford stories were going around about like what he was, he's like, what he's into, uh, you know, or, or, or whatever. Um, 
I started asking around because I, I know people that have done business with Randy Pitchford in the past. I know people that have, you know, that have been to his house that know his wife and, you know, you know, like all of that sort of stuff. Um, I kind of not, not in like an investigative, like, let's get to the bottom of this. It was just like, what's up with this dude? Cause he's a magician. Right. And so it's already, it's already weird. Um, but I will say the, the people, the, and I asked no fewer than four people, I think, um, what is Randy Pitchford's deal? And, uh, every response I got back was like, Hey, you know, Randy is actually like a super nice guy. Like, yeah, maybe he comes off awkward at times. He's, you know, he is super passionate about this magician stuff and, uh, and also his studio, you know, like, like, like he, and sometimes that comes across weird or, or whatever. Um, that was, that was kind of the, the responses that I generally got. Um, where people going like, no, like, like Randy's not a, a weird, basically these people vouching is like, Randy is not some weird creep. He is not, you know, like, that, like that is not, that is not accurate. Um, and then he's just, you know, kind of an awkward guy. And, and, you know, I, I think some of his Twitter outbursts and stuff, especially around Battleborn, um, were the sort of things you, sh you know, someone should have gotten him in and be like, Hey, don't. Like, don't make a weird run at Game Informer over, you know, your your game, your hobby-grade MOBA not being great. Uh, they're not certainly not alone in thinking that it's not great. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't I don't really... I don't, I don't have a good answer to that because, you know, it's like, obviously, you know, people are going to only report what they saw, right? So, you know, it's, it's a handful of people said like, oh, you know, Randy's he's not a, he's not a creep. He's just... he's. He's a little out there at times, but Randy, Randy's just Randy, like that type of, that type of response. And that, uh, uh you know, that he was just kind of a, a regular guy, but you know, I, however far that goes, I, I don't, I don't really know, but, uh, but for what it's worth, that was the response I pretty much got back from, from a number of people that I do trust pretty implicitly about stuff, um, was like, Hey, you know, this, this, yeah. He's he's a little weird. Also, you know. Also, this guy fucked him over. This guy, you know, like like kind of interesting stuff along those lines. But I so I don't know. I think that uh, Randy's choice in shirts is always uh, a little over the top. But when you look at his shirts and go, "What the fuck is this dude thinking?" You have to remember he's a magician. He's gonna wear loud shirts. <laughs> He's gonna, uh, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna be that dude. I mean, he owns, he, he, they, they did purchase the magic castle here in, in, in Los Angeles. Like dude is dedicated to magic in a way that, uh, more so than video games, as far as I can tell. But, um, but like, we don't, what, what do you, you know, look, are you really going to hang Randy Pitchford for having some pornography? Is that a thing? You're, are we really going to be like, oh, tut, tut, no, mm, I don't know. Are we going to suddenly get on our high fucking horse and get all weirdly moral about Randy Pitchford, like having some squirt vids on a USB stick? Like, okay, sure. In that situation, like, yeah, you know, hey, maybe don't, maybe don't lose the thing. Maybe don't whatever, but like, you know, but Let he who is without squirt vid sin cast the first stone. Huh? Um. But, you know. Keep it in the cloud, man. I don't know. If anything, yeah. If if you if you gotta if you got if you gotta if you gotta hang the man for anything, it's like, what why did you have that in your pocket and not safely on a computer somewhere or maybe someone just gave it to him someone's like hey check this shit out and maybe you got weird porn friends like that i don't anymore you know maybe someone's gonna load a psp up with some weird porn vids at some point and go check this out. like what what no one has porn friends anymore because it's 2024 and you don't need that because the porn is everywhere all the time whether you want it or not Um, 
Jose from Florida writes in. I was listening to your most recent podcast. You were talking about copies of Gravity Games, Bike, Street Vert Dirt being dumped at a Costco, and it brought back memories. Back in 2002 or 3, my mom got me an original Xbox game for Christmas. A game she said cost her $8 from a bin at Sam's Club. That game was Kabuki Warriors. Whew. I was 12 years old at the time, old enough to know when a game was crap just by looking at the box art. Still, I enjoyed my time with it, even if it was just for a little. After the podcast, I was curious to see how the game was received. I searched it, and funny enough, the first thing that came up was a link to a review of the game written by you. You gave it 1.4 out of 10. Holy crap, it wasn't that bad. Personally, I would have given the game a 6 out of 10 back when I was younger. Are there any games in retrospect that you enjoyed as a kid, but now know they were crap? Yeah, Kabuki Warriors is a miserable video game. It, it plays like absolute trash. It, it is it is no 6 out of 10. If we're using the full scales here, Kabuki Warriors is uh, absolutely terrible. Um, It's a bummer that it's that bad, but it's real bad. It's real, real bad. Um, But I, you know, games you play as a kid, I, I played every game as a kid. Good, bad, I didn't care, you know, especially if it was something I got as a gift and you're like, well, I guess, I guess I'm getting the most out of this because it's, what am I going to do? Not play video games? That's not an option. Um, so yeah, Kabuki Warriors is bad, but if I was 12 and got a copy of Kabuki Warriors, I would probably play way more of it than anyone ever should. In fact, reading this email now, I'm like, I should go back and take a look at Kabuki Warriors because I bet that's hilarious. But, uh, yikes. Yikes. Um, Cincinnati Eric writes in and says, Recently, my buddy and I started playing with the idea of making some rap tracks. He just got into music production with Fruity Loops, and his beats are actually really fucking good. I'm just going to say I doubt that. <laughs> but... Anything's possible. In fact, they were so good, I did something out of character. I tried rapping over them. Now, mind you, I have a history in punk bands and music and not an iota of experience in rapping. Due to your rapping history, I was wondering if you had any pointers or tips. When it comes to writing raps, examples include workflow, recording technique, etc. What wisdom can you impart upon me? So... I think uh, anyone anyone can record a rap. Anyone can. It just depends on how much time you're willing to put into it. Um, if you want to write your own raps and do all of that stuff, I think that the thing I used to do um, when I first start when I was first writing songs um, is I knew I was writing sixteen bars. I would actually take a piece of paper and I would dash out, like put dashes next to 16 lines. So I knew what I had to work with. Um, and I would fill in the, basically fill in the blanks from there. Uh, the other thing I'll say, especially because you have some music experience, I know some, uh, we talked, we briefly referenced it on the live game boys to men Q and a that Glenn and I did. But like we know a handful of people that were in punk bands that actually fucking rap really well. That just like started a rap group on the side as a joke. And you're like, God damn it. These guys are fucking good. <laughs> um, and so I think having some sort of experience in that is, is actually like. Um, it helps. The thing I will say. Helped me when it came to thinking about. Um, writing raps and, and the, the concept of flow and the concept of, of all of that sort of stuff of how to make, how to make songs, how to make your raps sound correct on beat. And nowadays people, you know, they're all over the place. They're behind the beat. They're in front of it. They're fucking fucked up on lean, just going whatever. And, and, and that works too. That's fine. You know, it's a, it's a, but I, I was very much like it was a little more regimented because that's, that's how I wanted to do it. Um, and for that, I would say, remember that like your voice is essentially a percussive instrument in this situation. Think about it. Like you think about drums, think about it, think about flow. 
if you were to take a pair of bongos, and not that you would put bongos over a lot of rap tracks or whatever, but like, think about it like, uh, uh, what does a flow sound like? Is it da 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 Like, think about it as someone fucking around on a set of bongos over a track or, or, you know, or whatever, like a pencil on a table or, or, or whatever. And like bang out some kind of percussion, um, that sounds okay over that beat. And then, you know, write that, write your words that way, fill in the blanks again, you know, like fill in the syllables, think about it down to the syllable. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess like the, 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 the short version of it is think of your voice as a percussive instrument in the mix. Um, in terms of like how many syllables you want to cram onto one bar and how you want the bar after that to sound, given that this bar sounded that way, what should this one sound like? To, and I, I think, you know, that's all it really took for me. Um, and then if you can't do that, you know, uh, get someone else to write it and then just punch it. It's super easy. Re recording is so easy. Record, you know, like punching your lines in, in a way that isn't obvious, um, is super easy to do as long as you can perform one bar at a time, uh, or perhaps, uh, anytime I did punches, we would, I would record the two lines before the punch and the two lines and, and, and after try to go as long as I could basically. Uh, but I would start a bar or two before the punch so that I was already doing those words. And so it had a more natural, like, oh, the breathing still sounds the way it would normally sound. The syllables aren't stepping on each other and, and, and so on and so forth. And so I think that, uh, that helped, uh, kind of maintain some kind of, um, you know, you're not stepping on yourself. You can record in such a way, and that's a stylistic choice, but if you record one bar at a time, you could lead to situations where you've punched vocals over the top of yourself. And, um, again, a stylistic choice, that's fine. What you're also doing there is letting the world know that you couldn't do it all at once. And it's much easier to hide those punches and, and make people think you're more skilled than you are. If you just, if you do it the other way, um, but it depends on what you want to sound like, what you want to do. Um, but that's, I, I ultimately, I think it's, it's, it's really not like I, I, I have taken multiple people who were not, uh, skilled rapists and I have, uh, uh, recorded them one bar at a time, two bars at a time, half a bar at a time and, and punched it all together. In those cases, I recorded a version, like I recorded scratch vocals, you know, for them to listen to and then try to duplicate that. And they would rap over me and then you just take me out and you punt, piece it all together and it's not that difficult. It's all recording tricks at that point, but um, it's doable that way. You're better off just doing it. You're, you're better off just rapping at the, at the end of the day, if you can, if you can, if you can, but, um, everyone starts somewhere. And I think, I think that, you know, you can go graduate from one to the next or, or whatever works for you. But that was always the thing. The, the, the thing I always said, if you can fucking count to four and you can fucking make it rhyme and whatever, the rest kind of falls into place. But the reality of it, as I thought about that some more is also the idea of treating your voice as a percussive instrument and thinking about like, if there were an extra little like drum tappy tap, tap, tap on this, what would it sound like? And that's all flows are. That's all flows really are. Um, are just like different ways to kind of tap that out. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's, that's how I always thought about it. Mark writes in, I've always wondered about the journalistic ethics of a lot of different video game magazines. First, you have magazines like Nintendo Power or OPM or OXM that are basically propaganda machines for their chosen console or company. Those ones always struck me as a little more obvious, and I think most readers probably went in with the expectation that the information they were going to be receiving would be biased. But then you have magazines owned by or partnering with video game stores like Game Informer and GameStop. These ones always seemed like there would be more ethical dilemmas at play. I can't imagine GameStop would be very happy with Game Informer, 
if they were out there shitting on games before they come out because that might kill pre-orders. How does that dynamic work in a journalistic sense? Um, so I, I've never worked at Game Informer. Um, so I, I can only go by conversations I've had with people who did. Um, but the way the official magazines worked, your OPMs and your Nintendo Powers, my understanding is that ultimately they did what a lot of influencers kind of, or influencer adjacent types of coverage do where they don't, they just don't spend a bunch of time on the bad stuff. And these days there are so many games coming out. It's never been easier to only cover good games and, uh, and to take bad games. And you know, you have situations where if a major game is bad, then you're like, well, we've got to cover it. And that's, you know, well then, then you're up against it maybe a little bit. I don't know. But Nintendo Power never really had to devote it to too much space to a bad game. Um, and so generally speaking, I think, you know, they would do that, that sort of thing that I think a lot of people on YouTube do where they, you know, they just never really cover bad games. They never really have a bad thing to say about a game because they're covering a subsection of the products. It'd be, it's very easy to, to, to do that easier all the time, I think. Um, but, you know, I think you would have a situation with like some of these official, official magazines where um, you would be getting some information from the rights holder, you know, Sony or, or Microsoft or, or whatever would be like, here's what we have for you this month. And you'd write about it or, or here's what we can give you. But I think generally, you know, a lot of these magazines were still relatively in competition with other press outlets. Um, and they maybe would get a little bit extra by being the official magazine, but like the official, the official magazines and when and were never the biggest outlets there. So it would still be a case of like a game spot or an IGN or something would get the big exclusive. And then, you know, OXM would have some follow up, or they would maybe have an additional interview or, you know, something, but, um, yeah, I don't know. They, I, I don't think that they were. Like most of those magazines, Nintendo Power was run internally for a good long time, and then eventually it got outsourced to Future. I think, I think it was Future running Nintendo Power for a while. Um, and uh, at that point, yeah, it's like the, the there's someone at Nintendo that probably looks over the magazine and you know maybe suggests some changes, but probably doesn't most of the time because you're just kind of covering what you're covering and and that's that and they they probably had some some unwritten rules about you know just like hey don't don't go after a game don't be mean about it if, you, if there's a game you don't like and you still have to cover it and you know hey just just be quick about it and move on um that would be my guess uh the only time i've ever had to really officially work in that type of capacity was a brief period of time where we were doing a radio show that was an official playstation radio show um, and with that, we had, we had a liaison at Sony who would listen to the episode. We would basically talk to them and be like, who should we interview this month? And they would have a person and be like, okay, yeah, we'll talk to this person about the game they're working on. And then, you know, we would record and then the person at Sony might have notes for the person editing the show to edit a couple of things out or, or whatever. But also you kind of go into it knowing like, oh, I, you know, like if I, if I go on a big rant about how the PlayStation's a piece of dog shit, like that's not going to make air, <laughs> you know, and, and it's going to sabotage this business deal. And it's like also not how I felt. So was like, you know, it's whatever. If I felt that way, I would have said, don't put me on the PlayStation radio show. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not the guy for this. Um, so, but, but they would have some changes and stuff like that. I don't remember us ever pushing back on those changes because it was always super minor and not really ever about anything meaningful. It was really just like polishing the show up most of the time. It wasn't like, oh, I can't believe you got into this topic of conversation. We have to cut this whole thing. It was, it was never really anything like that. Um, so I, I, yeah, I don't really know. I think every, everyone in that relationship probably knows what they're doing and they're like, okay, yeah, we're going to be professionals about this. But at the end of the day, this is meant to be this official magazine it is not meant to be some unbiased publication. It is meant to be the official magazine. Um, as for game informer and GameStop, the, the, the talk that I think a lot of people always had was like, Oh, the cover of game informer is for sale. 
that was something that people would say. Um, and Andy McNamara, who was running Game Informer for a lot of years, um, always said that that was not the case. So I, I, I don't, for, for what it's worth, he always said that that was not the case. So, uh, you know, you, you can take that. Um, and then after he left, I don't, I don't know what the situation is. I know, you know, like I, GameStop is a weird company and, and then the stories I always heard from people who worked at Game Informer, uh, was that basically uh, no one at the corporate level gave a fuck about that thing to the point where if they wanted a raise or they felt they were being underpaid or they felt like we need more people or if they were asking for anything ever, it would get to a certain corporate level and they would look at it and be like, yeah, sure, yeah, we're going to spend more money on this. And then that would be that um, for the most part. I, you know, I'm sure, you know, I know that they, this is now a decade ago or something like that. They, they, you know, they, they did rebuild their studio at some point. So there was money invested into that over the years, but, but I don't know where Game Informer is at these days in terms of, uh, just size and influence and all that other stuff. Right. I mean, you know, kind of, we talked about physical game sales and where those are heading. So if your magazine is attached to a physical store that is trying to sell games and they're like, uh, get a membership and you get a copy of this magazine and then you get used game sales and like, where are those going? And I'm like, at some point that whole thing falls apart. They were, I mean, there was that whole era there and, and the Ziff magazines had to figure this out too. And I don't know that they figured it out in a truly elegant way ever either. Um, but it was the idea of how do you, how do you run a magazine and sell your magazine in an era where everyone is online. And so by the time your magazine is on shelves, anyone who wants scans of it or just like the information in it, that's already out there. There's no hiding it. Uh, no one needs to buy the magazine to hear the two sentences of new information in this interview, because it, as soon as the subscriber copies went out, the exclusive was leaked everywhere. Right? So, so like trying to figure out and, and then if you put, but, but the flip side of that is if you put your entire magazine online and put it on a website, then who's going to buy your magazine. And if you put up a paywall to put that stuff on the, you know, like, uh, the, the bumps in the road. I know that was something when Ziff launched one up, which we talked a little bit about the formation of one up last week. Um, and kind of how in a weird way, GameSpot was sort of responsible for that, I guess, in some, some weird way. Um, they did, uh, because we were no longer part of the same company anymore. Uh, when we, we knew that they were building a website, we knew that, that, that the Ziff was, was building a website because we were all part of the same company. And then we were running the EGM website and we were, you know, and as part of that acquisition, that is when we got the rights to the domain video games.com. And so if video game spot.com became video games.com. Uh, and then in the years that followed, it all eventually became game spot and we stopped using the video games.com brand. And so when Ziff split off or when we got sold to CNET, I guess it was. And Ziff and ZDNet split along the way too. So like the ZDTV stuff went in a different direction and eventually became Tech TV and then G4. And then all, all of the corporate fucking weird shit. At some point, Ziff came back to us and said, hey, can we get videogames.com back from you? <laughs> and just asked for it back. And I believe our response was like, fucking no, what? And so they went with oneup.com instead. Um which is a good short domain. Uh, but like they immediately ran into the problem of like, okay, the people running one up want to have the best articles and best exclusives and best things on it. But the people running the print magazines don't want to share that information with the people on one up because they don't want their, they want, they want to sell magazines. And so you had different people with different goals who were kind of at odds for a long time there. And, um, and, you know, like it always seemed like a very hard problem for them to figure out. And they tried a lot of different things over the years because, you know, we'd, we'd watch them and kind of see what they were doing and, and seeing how they were trying to figure it out. 
And for a while there, they were doing a thing where like, if a magazine had an exclusive, then one up would put it, would try to have it in their top slot for like a full week and have like additional information. And Game Informer would do the same thing where it's like the exclusive information in the magazine. And then over the course of the month, they would have like, we're going to have additional coverage of this game on the website over the course of the next 30 days. And, and trying to extend that stuff onto the website with unique content that wouldn't cannibalize the sales of the magazine. Um, I never was in this position of having to do this, but that's my understanding is, is that that's, that's all the sort of stuff that they tried. Um, and I don't know that any of it really worked out all that well. Um, I, I don't know that any of that ever really did super well for them, but, um, but I remember hearing, you know, and, and this is something that we kind of experienced when we were all part of the same company and we were running, when we were running the EGM website, it was like Joe Fielder put up a couple of articles a month, two weeks after the magazine came out or something like that. And, you know, it, it wasn't, it was a really anemic, it was, a, it was a really, really small effort. Um, it was really like, if you just went to the website, it was like, subscribe to the magazine. Here's a couple of stories that are in this month's issue. And it there wasn't really much to it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, it's all, it's always, it was a very weird problem to solve that. Like the, the stories I always heard coming out of there is that people for a time, at least were very much at odds with each other, both at game informer and at the Ziff publications because of that idea of like, Hey, I don't know if you know this, but the future is online on the internet. And so us clinging to this print magazine for dear life is going to be the end of us. And then the, the other argument being, hey, if we don't give people a reason to buy this magazine, if we put all these stories onto our website, we'll be gone in a month. Because why would anyone buy the magazine? And that's what's paying all our salaries right now. And, and so finding ways to make that transition, um, they never did. You know, obviously, like the Ziff publications all kind of went away and 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 one up went eventually went away and Game Informer is still there. But I it still doesn't feel like Game Informer has necessarily figured that out other than like they have PDF versions of the magazine that go out to subscribers now. Right. I mean, that's the they've done that for for years and years and years. I assume they still do that. I, I actually don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. That That's always a hard problem. I mean, print print is a weird thing and it gets i mean especially now i mean the idea of print seems like insane to me um and but even then it did too i mean i you know like we i started at GameSpot in 1996 and i would say by the year 99 the idea of a print magazine seemed like quaint to me of like, oh yeah, come out once a month. And it was actually, it, it, I, uh, some, some hard feelings, I suppose, when we, wa we were all part of the same company because we shared a booth with the magazine guys. Uh, and I've, I talked about this before. Like a lot of the magazine guys did not like us. There were some that r did some reviews for us and we paid them freelance rates and, and, and they did some great work for us. There were others that just like looked down on or, or seemingly looked down on us. The people on the PC side, the people at CGW certainly looked down on GameSpot in a way that I'm surprised did not lead to a fist fight. Um, but being at E3 and watching the people from the Ziff print magazines just kind of hang out because they had three weeks to write their issue while we were frantically running back to the booth to write shit up. Um, was fucking fucked. <laughs> it was fucked. I mean, it, like, like you're, you're watching like just editors for EGM and some of these other magazines just like standing around going like, Oh yeah, I don't know. I'm going to go check this out. Uh, oh, yeah, I got, I got this appointment. I'm gonna go look at this and you know, oh, we're looking at this thing. And so they would get all the back, the, the, the extra behind closed doors things because they would say like, oh, this is going to be in our September issue, but we saw it at E3. And so they're not showing that to non-print publications and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so like that, but that whole process was like, I don't know, demoralizing maybe isn't the word. It was more of like, um, this shitty self-righteous anger of like, yeah, okay. You guys are standing around doing, doing Jack fuck. 
Um, but I'll tell you what, this is still going to be here in 10 years. Uh, maybe I won't be, <laughs> but, uh, but the website is, um, yeah, it, it, it was a lot. And, and then you would have them like, boy, oh boy, really looks like, um, you guys, I, I wouldn't want to do what you guys are doing. And so when they started a website, it never felt like they wanted to actually start a website because most of those print guys didn't want to work the online schedule, but they didn't necessarily go out and hire a zillion people for the website stuff. This is probably an interesting story. I, I'm not the person to tell it because I was not there, but, um, but I'm sure that there's a very interesting story to be told about what it was like to actually be at Ziff in the early days of of starting one up and, 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 and the, the transition to online and, and all of that sort of stuff. The CGW story, I've told it before. We, we, we referenced it on the on game boys to men, but like, man, all right, I'll, I'll quickly, I will click quickly get into it. When we all merged and became part of the same company, basically Ziff Davis bought spot media communications, the, the parent company of GameSpot, And so we were all brought in to be part of Ziff. And they decided they wanted to get the staffs of GameSpot, which included us, even though we were the console guys, um, and the staff of CGW to get together because I get the CGW staff was in town or I, I don't know. They were, we met at the ferry building in San Francisco. They rented out this big long table and all this other stuff. And so the idea was like, oh, let's get together and talk and yeah, we, we'll figure out how to work together. We'll figure out what it is and you know, but let's just get together and meet each other and just hang out in a room for a couple hours. And I was like, all right, cool, whatever. So we go down there and, and get in there. And, uh, Johnny Wilson, who was the editor in chief of CGW at the time gets up and just proceeds to talk shit about us to our faces for what felt like half an hour or an hour or something. What I'm sure it was more like five minutes about, um, at CGW, you know, we, we pride ourselves on, uh, you know, reviewing final versions of games and we play the games and we have a phrase, uh, we, we call them shrink pop reviews. Uh, and that's when you pop the shrink wrap off and then immediately write the review. And you know what we say? We have a saying, when you hear the shrink pop must be GameSpot. And it was like, are you fucking kidding me? Cause GameSpot prided itself on being later than other publications specifically because we waited for final versions of a game because we played the games and made sure to play the games. Like of all of the online publications at the time to be trying to start shit with the PC side of GameSpot was not the fucking place to go with that shit because GameSpot's PC team, which, you know, Greg Kasavin was there at that point, but like, you know, there were people on that fucking team that put in the fucking work. And so for that fucking guy to get up there in front of everybody and talk all that shit, it was like, okay, uh, so I guess we're not working together then. I guess fuck you asshole. What the fuck is like, what are we doing here? Like it was just, it was crazy. Uh, it was fucking crazy to the point where Glenn and I still talk about it to this day of how fucking insane of a meeting it was. It was just like, what are, did that just fucking happen? Did that dipshit come in here and try and fucking say we don't fucking play games? Um, just f fucking nuts, man. It's just like, I, I don't remember what happened after that. I, I don't like, that's all I remember of that meeting. I don't remember if that ended the meeting or if there was more to talk about after that. I just remember that and being like, oh, the fuck these print guys. Oh, they think that like, oh, the, the internet kids are, oh, they'll be gone. Oh, this fad. And like, good luck, motherfucker. Um, it was crazy. Um, it was really crazy. It's just, it's, it's so like, even just talking about it now, it's like one of the top five, like maddest I've been things. I like maddest I've been in a work situation of just like, are you fucking kidding me? Oh, we bent over backwards to have timely reviews of final products. We went fucking so above and beyond to fucking not be the thing that he fucking walked in and fucking claimed that we did. It was like bizarre. It was just like, okay, well, that's not us. That guy just sounds like he doesn't want to talk to us ever again. 
So, fuck him. Um, and I don't think I ever talked to him ever again. Uh, I don't know that I ever talked to him that day either because he was just like, well, you know. Um, but it was nuts. I don't know if Jeff Green was there at that point. I don't know if Jeff Green would have been um, at CGW then. I don't know when it was he started. I, I didn't, I don't think I became aware of Jeff Green for another couple of years after that. Um, but I hope I, I kind of, I, I should, I should, I should hit, hit, hit him up and see if he was there for that because I'm really curious if, uh, if he was there for that. And if he has any memory of that specific meeting, because holy shit. Um, uh, some more uh, meaningless old shit here. Uh, let's talk about from uh, Elvin in Norway. It says, hey, I remember the Voom TV channel. Every night from 11 p.m. to midnight, there would be video game content. So this is a deal that GameSpot did when HD became a thing. Uh, we, we signed a deal with this, these Voom guys, and then suddenly we had to shoot everything in HD because we were chopping it up and presenting packages, repackaged GameSpot content for Voom that then aired on TV somewhere. We had no way of getting it. I don't know if it even aired in the U.S. or, or what the deal was, but, but Voom was a thing. And we also hired people like Homer, um... Homer and Jan and um, there's one other person that I think we hired as a result of like, okay, we need to do HD camera work. We need, we need people to, to come in and, and, uh, and, and process that information or whatever. So the, we got to hire a few, a few more video people as a result of it. So it worked out on our end for, for those reasons. Anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, in fact, apparently this aired in Norway because from 11 p.m. to midnight, there were video game content. From what I recall, it included footage from esports tournaments with commentary. I recall seeing tournament play of StarCraft, Warcraft, Dota, and Counter-Strike. Playthroughs of games from start to finish. No narration edited down to an hour. I remember that. Yeah. This is how I got Shadow of the Colossus and Oddworld Stranger's Wrath spoiled for me. Chunks of gameplay from various games narrated by a British-sounding lady. I wonder who that would have been. Someone from GameSpot UK, maybe? I don't know. And a weird version of On the Spot, which surprised me the most. I remember the host being a young-looking guy and the background being all white. He was basically introducing the different segments we got to watch, very different from the real On the Spot. I was confused at the time since it was a new TV channel that suddenly just appeared one day and then randomly tuning in and seeing video games, which was rare to see on any TV channel, and then seeing that they were showing GameSpot content. Yeah, um... But yeah, basically it was their job to take everything that we were doing and edit it down for these various, however often they had to send things off to Voom. And so, yeah, they did. They just, sometimes they were just in their offices playing games and recording footage that they were then going to edit down into these hours or, or whatever. And so it was just like random HD video footage. Uh, and sometimes it was segments of video reviews and some other stuff that we had done editorially that they were chopping up and representing there. And so, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I was, I don't remember the specifics or, or how long it lasted, but yeah, that was, I remember that Voom deal being good for us specifically because it let us upgrade all of our equipment to HD. Uh, and also it let us hire uh, a handful of people. Um, Ben in Boston writes in with the recent numbers showing PlayStation outselling Xbox Series X and S by about three to one. And the Microsoft document leak from last year showing that about 75% of those sales were Series S. How do you feel these days about Xbox's decision to release two versions of their console? Has it helped or hurt them this generation? I, I think it's helped them. I, I think... Um, if all they had was a console that was in price and power comparable to the PlayStation 5 and they didn't have any other option for people that were more budget minded. I mean, clearly people are choosing PlayStation three to one, even in light of them having a, a, a more affordable option, right? So imagine if they didn't have that more affordable option, then all of the people on a budget uh, that you would be able to sell that console to either don't buy anything 
or they're much more likely to go PlayStation because people seem to be just going PlayStation all the time because, you know, of whether it's their software lineup or whatever ecosystem reasons, like, you know, whatever reasons people choose a PlayStation over an Xbox. Um, so I think the Xbox Series S has has probably kept them afloat in a weird way. Um, not, not, not that they're going under, but I mean, you know, the the gaming hardware business, they would probably be in a much deeper hole than just three to one if they were not also selling the Xbox Series S. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Jeremy in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Michigan? MI. MI is Michigan. Right. Or, or is it Mrs. No, MS is Mrs. Anyway. Recently, while listening to the live Game Boys to Men Q&A, which is on Patreon, uh, for anyone of, of any tier of Patreon has access to that, uh, that Q&A. It's up as audio and video if you want to check that out. Me and Glenn talking about a wide variety of topics. Um, one of the topics that really struck me was the idea of content creation and discoverability. Clearly in the past few years, modern games media has been at a crossroads with many publications experiencing layoffs or downright closing. We have the rise of listener and viewer supported sites and the constant shifts in content styles with the rise of things like short form video a la TikTok. I recently started up a website of my own to write about games more to fill a creative void than anything else. And part of me struggles with the idea of games media's future. I'm doing it for myself and to fulfill a gap in my life. But part of me, because of the state of the media, often thinks, why try to put it out there when nobody will see it? Why not just journal or whatever? As someone who has been established in the industry for decades, how nihilistic are you about the future of games media? Do you feel like there's enough viability for new blood in the future? I'm I'm not nihilistic about the future of games media. I am nihilistic about the current existence or or the way games media currently exists. And the ad supported model given where advertising as a market is right now, not just in games but across all media, right? Um a advertising supported media um is a thing that I think has to exist in some form. It, it, we can't have everything disappear behind a paywall. The thing I always, when we were building a paywall back in 08 or 09 or whatever, and when it came to determining the mix between what content is free and what content is behind the paywall, it was always a big struggle to try to articulate what type of content goes here? What type of content goes there? And we eventually hit upon something that made sort of made sense, but not really because, okay, think about the, the thing I always came back to then, and it, it's a less meaningful um, comparison now just because of how long he's been doing it this way. And I think I, I, I was right in a, in a sense, but the comparison point I always had was Howard Stern. When Howard Stern was on ad-supported terrestrial radio, you heard about him a lot. Even before he was on the air on the West Coast, I heard news about this radio DJ that was on in other parts of the country um, in the 90s. And then in the, into the 2000s, stuff like that, you know, Howard Stern became, you know, the, when he started calling himself the king of all media and started doing these pay-per-views and writing books and, and private parts of the movie came out and, and you had all of this stuff. Like it seemed like Howard Stern was kind of everywhere or like had his hands into a lot of different stuff. Then one day he signs a deal with satellite radio and boom, it was all gone. Not entirely. You still, you know, he still had his, you know, the books still existed and, and a lot of that stuff, but the, the core of what he did, which is that five hour radio show, disappeared behind a paywall and it was gone. And so the conversations around it started to erode and disappear as well because even the people that were still talking about it had to be subscribers of this thing, which meant they were truckers. And I don't talk to enough truckers. I still don't. None of us do. 
We got a CB radio. We're going to talk, get talk truck. And so you'll still now, nowadays, like I'm TikTok has actually been the most I've seen of Howard Stern in a long time, because you'll see people chunking up interviews of that. He's done and, and throwing them out there and in a weird way. Uh, but the thing about creating a paywall and the thing about creating an, a, a, a viewer supported kind of thing is you still have to get out there for, I mean, there's business reasons to do it too, because if you're not out there with a product that people can experience for themselves for free, they'll never know what they're missing behind the paywall. Right. And so there's, there's a certain aspect of, of like, okay, you have to present something out there for everyone to check out because you need to get something uh, that gets people to, to say like, oh, I want more of this. I want to sign up for, I mean, now it's a Patreon. You go to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstmann and you will get more of more stuff. Uh, you will also get the uh, incredibly uh, positive feeling of keeping this nightmarish train on the tracks and keeping it out here for everyone, keeping it out there for, for all to enjoy as well as yourself. Um, and so uh, I, I think that th that was always the thing I thought about back in 08, 09, because there was always temptations. You know, you'd always have some business guy who'd be like, well, just do everything by the paywall. I'm like, okay, yeah. But when we do that, we disappear. And when you disappear, it then also becomes harder. Like if you're trying to negotiate exclusives, which we were not, but if you were trying to be an, a functioning editorial operation, uh, those people want eyeballs on their, on their exclusives. They want, they want the thing to be seen by people. And so you are completely out of that game as well of like, okay, well now only people can see us if they're paying us. And, uh, magazines would try to spin that sometimes as like, oh yeah, uh, GameSpot might have a million people a day looking at it, but how many of them buy games? How many of them care? We have an engaged audience that's told us that our information is so good that they're willing to pay for it. So of course they're going to buy your game. And so you should give the information to us. Which is always a, I don't know. I, that, that, that's a pitch you could make. Sure. Uh, it always seemed a little backwards to me, but of course it would. But the striking that balance is actually the hardest part about running a business like this. It still is. Uh, because it, it, it taps into like, how do you get this in front of more people and discoverability for an operation like this is really difficult. Um, how do you get more people to check it out? How do you get more people to sign up? How do you get more people to do this? You know, the, the if you have a finite number of hours in the day and there's only so much type of things you can produce, what are the right things to produce to check as many different boxes as you can? And that's a problem you'll have if you have eight people or if you have one person. It's the same problem. Uh, you just have to tackle it in different ways. Um, but I'm not, I would not say I'm nihilistic about the future of games media. I think that it has to completely crash and burn and be reborn. And I don't think it's completely, cra I don't think it's bottomed out. I think that we're going to see. And yeah, what's left really? Like if we're, you know, the, if we're, I guess what's left is actually there is, there is a, a very wide range. Uh, it's tempting to say like, oh, it's GameSpot and IGN, but no, it, it's, it's Eurogamer. It's Video Games Chronicle. It's, it's, it's Gamatsu. Gamatsu? Gamatsu. Um, a ton of other publications. Kotaku is out there. Is, is Rock, Paper, Shotgun still there? Yeah, Kotaku still exists. Um... Like there are a ton of, of, there are still a ton of gaming focused publications out there. And then you have the new batch starting up as well. You know, your, your remap radios and your, your aftermaths and such, your, uh, VGBs and so on. Um, and then you have people that are doing different things in different formats or, or, or becoming more video focused in a way like Danny O'Dwyer did. In some ways, Danny O'Dwyer is a pioneer, but also in a lot of ways, I think Danny O'Dwyer is a pioneer of a thing that you cannot duplicate because he is out there doing it so well. Um, which is a good place to be, I think. I don't know. I don't, I don't follow his numbers. I assume he's doing fantastic. Um, 
but I think that, yeah, I, I think that there's a an interesting variety out there now. So it's not dead, but it's not thriving, you know, it's it, and we will probably never get back to a place where you've got the editorial bullpen or whatever you want to call it. And you've got like 20 people in there the way GameSpot did in 2003 to 2006 or so, you know, whatever it was. Like, I don't think like the, the things that have to line up for a publication to be able to employ that many people full time and actually have like that wide of a staff be able to be paid and, uh, and so on and so forth. I think that that is a really hard dream to see at any time down the line in the foreseeable future. But also I don't think that you need a team that large to be impactful. I think kind of funny is actually like a really kind of funny is another publication, another outlet, I guess the publications are weird. I think that they are pioneering in a lot of ways as well. Um, and at the time, I think, you know, Greg had said that he looked at some of the stuff that, that we were doing, but I think what kind of funny is doing is smarter in a lot of ways because they did not pigeonhole themselves. They did not, they did not shut themselves out of certain types of content. They, they allowed themselves to kind of see what was out there. They also allowed themselves to be on all these third party platforms that like at the time we had to build ourselves because YouTube wasn't in 2007 and eight, YouTube was not what it is now and Patreon didn't exist and so on and so forth, you know? So, so like these types of things that kind of funny is able to do is truly impressive. And I think that's, you see that in that studio they built. Um, that is the first time in a very long time that I have been like genuinely, I look at that studio and go, man, you guys fucking did it. That's I'm, I'm so happy for them for what they have built and also a little jealous for what they have built. Cause I just look at it and go like, that's such a fucking cool set. That's such a, you, you've gotten to such a great place with this stuff and that's fantastic. Um, it's, it's really great what they are doing. Uh, you, and, and their content is not, no content is for everyone, right? I, 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 every time I bring it kind of funny, I think there's a, there's a, just a certain percentage of people who are just like, I don't I'm like, all right, fine. You don't, you don't have to vibe with the, those personalities or whatever, but I think what they're doing and the amount of content they're able to put out and the amount of people they've been able to, the amount of people they have been able to bring on, whether it's in a full-time capacity or, or what have you. No one in this line of work is creating jobs the way they did. Even still, it's, you know, all these new publications that are launching are at best taking freelance pitches, which is great, but it's not healthcare, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I, I think that, that what they've done in, in, a, in a, especially in a, in a challenging era to do what they did, I think is really impressive. And they just had, what was it, their nine-year anniversary? That's fucking crazy. That they've been at it for this long. Um, but um, but I, again, I, I don't think that that's necessarily a blueprint that can be fully followed. I think if you look at what they're doing, there's things to learn. Um, and I think that you, a lot of people try to bring up the... Uh, the dead spin, the, the, whatever the dead spin guys started that everyone, uh, the defector model of like defector doing this advertising or this, uh, this subscription supported publication and so on and so forth. The, I, the thing that always breaks down for me, for me, when people say like, why doesn't someone make the defector, but for video games, it's like, well, okay. I mean, now at this point between aftermath and remap radio and some of this other stuff that out there, like that, they, that is what they are basically in, in some ways trying to do. And the reason I always would say, I don't think that that's necessarily the best move for, I mean, where I have the things I want to build is because the defector model doesn't include a ton of fucking high priced hosted video. <laughs> it doesn't include a ton of 4k video behind a paywall and that that stuff has to be hosted somewhere. And that stuff has to, the, the bandwidth has to be paid for. And the, like all of that sort of stuff, like the issues with doing video game coverage um, 
in that defector model is that the costs for video game coverage, if you want to do it that way, if you want to do, hey, we're doing a ton of video coverage, a ton of podcasts, video podcasts, like that sort of thing, that gets very expensive very quickly. And so, you know, um, that's where the, that model always broke up for me. It's like, okay, like the, the, the future of video game coverage, I think, it's, I think it's cool that there's more writing. I enjoy writing. I enjoy reading, writing about games now in a way that I didn't when I was writing about games uh, because I was writing about games. And I was like, I, I read writing about games all day from the people in this room. I don't need to go look at what other people are, you know, like, sorry, I don't, I don't, I'm not keeping track of what they're, they're doing in a granular way. Um, but I enjoy reading uh, a lot of writing about games now, you know, it's the stuff that, that Patrick's doing, um, on his newsletter, as well as the remap stuff as well, you know, like the, the aftermath stuff has been, has been good aftermath.site for that. Um, and I think a site like videogameschronicle.com is doing really good at running a really good, responsible and up-to-date news feed. I think they're doing a really good job of covering games um, in, in a in kind of newsy, interviewee kind of way. I think they're, they're doing a, a, a really good job um, in a more traditional sense because they're still doing reviews and, and they've got a podcast now, of course. Um, but I think, yeah, at the end of the day, I, I think that, and that's not to say that like uh, we should be cramming writing into videos. I think it's more about video games are an inherently audio visual medium and why not present it that way? If you, if you can, if, if, if you want to, right. I mean, but, but there are plenty of ways to write about games. There are plenty of ways that you, the, what I'm saying, the, the, what I, the long winded thing I'm trying to get to here is that the people that are making eight minute YouTube videos about strategy, like instead of writing two sentences about, Hey, wh I'm stuck in this game. Where do I go? The people that are making nine minute YouTube videos that, uh, in a roundabout way, eventually show you what you're looking for. That ain't it. It's gross. Algorithmically. I'm sure it very much is it or was it or, or whatever, but it's, it's disgusting. Um, so it's, for me, it's all about like finding the right fit for the type of content you're doing and the type of content that I found myself enjoying the most is like this. It's why I, you know, like it would have been very easy a year and a half ago or whatever, however long it's been, um, to no longer do the podcast live, uh, and have a little bit more control over how it's produced and edited and, and so on and so forth. It would have been even easier to say it's no longer a video podcast. So it makes it even easier to edit because then you don't have to cover the edits in the video with footage or whatever you're doing. You can just chop up the, the audio. And, and I've had people come to me and say like, Hey, are you looking for help editing your podcast? And I'm like, no, because it's live. And so editing it, uh, people will know that they've missed something. And even if what they missed was bad, uh, or, or edited out for a reason, it still leads to this feeling that they have missed something. And that's, I don't like that. And so that's ultimately why this podcast doesn't get edited. Um, and I like that a lot. I like being live. I love being live. I love having a chat feed up especially as someone who does not have a producer to say, Hey, the microphone is not turned on. Um, <laughs> having people in chat that can go, we can't fucking hear you is actually very useful. Um, I, so I, I love doing live podcasts. I don't, I wouldn't want to step away from it. Like, uh, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't want to do that. Like I had the opportunity to, right. You know, uh, but, but I, I love doing this. Uh, this specific way. And I, I've always treated it, especially now that I'm, you know, doing it solo. I, I think I, I look at it the same way that, uh, you know, a lot of these radio guys did it, you know? Um, and that's why I think about putting a a light bed of music under everything all the time. 
And I don't do that right now because I think if I did that, people would, would get mad about it. But it is something that Tom Sharpling does on the best show, which is now a podcast and, and, and no longer on the radio. But having a music bed means that if I have to stop talking for a second because I'm reading the next story or because I am taking a drink of a drink, people still hear the music and they know that, okay, it is still playing properly. And so I think about that a lot. And the, the one change I would make to the podcast, I think, would be a very, very low, extremely low in the mix, um, little bit of music, a little bit of audio, a little bit of something. Um, but it's not something that it seems like a dire need. It's not something that seems like a, a, a massive inclusion, uh, that has to happen or anything like that. It's just something that like, if, if, if this was a radio show, someone would do that. If somebody, if this was a radio show, that would be the, how they would solve that problem is they would have a, 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 they would have a bed under it. That's what they do. That's why they do it. Uh, some podcasts put the beds only under the ads, which I find funny because it makes it uh, a lot easier to skip their ads. Um, but anyway, as, as far as the future of games media, I think it, it's it, everything I talked about with regards to print magazines and how um, full of themselves some of those folks seemed back then and how at the time... It was very easy to look at them and go like, you guys are dinosaurs. You guys are going to all go away. Uh, because we are going to put you all out of business. And by we, I mean the internet in a, in a more general sense. But, you know, but like the, the type of coverage we were doing, the frequency we were updating, the, the number of stories we had per day. Why would you go anywhere else? Why would you subscribe to a fucking magazine and get your news three weeks late? Um, but at some point the websites became the dinosaurs, right? And this is, this, and at some point, and by, and by at some point, I mean like 10 years ago now, like that's kind of the weird thing, right? Is like, we talk about this, like it's happening, but like, dude, the rise of YouTube and influencers and, and the individual creators and, and all of that sort of stuff shot so many fucking holes in the big video game website, the, the presence of social media, the way that people stopped going to individual websites and just started getting their information from social media and maybe they click through, maybe they don't. Like that transition that the internet made turned all of these websites into dinosaurs. And how did they evolve? And they were the ones that were worried, you know, 14 years ago now, however long it was. They were the ones that were worried about like, oh man, this game publisher said we can't put their trailer up anymore on YouTube, but that's what powers our YouTube views. What are we going to do? You know, those were the sorts of things that they were worried about. And, and so in a lot of ways, they're, instead of figuring out what's next, they all make too much money to make that transition. And so they hold on to everything they can and they refuse to invest in the thing that could have been next. And they let that thing wither. Um, incredibly short-sighted but at least it's consistent. So now we're in this weird thing where now we're 10 years in on influencers. We're 10 years in on, on all this other stuff. We're, we're 15 years. We're, we're 20 years in on podcasts, I guess just about. And so what's actually next? Like, like and right now it seems like with the way the ad market is crashing, you know, it's entirely possible that more stuff does go away and we'll see this transition into these smaller, publications that are owned and operated by the people that are writing for them again, you know, and, and yeah, will AI come in and take some of that? No, cause the content has to come from somewhere. AI can rewrite a press release for you, but, um, getting rewritten press releases is not an expensive thing to do. If you're willing to pay your freelancers, the types of shitty rates that, uh, a lot of freelancers got to rewrite press releases back in the day. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I love podcasts. I've, I've always, that was something when I, I pushed, it took, it took work. It was not an easy thing to get GameSpot to agree to start a podcast. 
Um, but I, uh, I believed in it then specifically, I think probably because I, I just, I've always had a weird love of radio as, as someone who has a weird love of radio. I sure don't listen to any of it, but I, the idea of talk radio, the idea of morning drive time radio variety shows and interviews and all that sort of stuff. Like I believe in that. And, and that was what made me a believer in podcasts early on. I think podcasts can be a lot of different things now. Obviously, the, the format is stretched in so many different directions. Um, but I love podcasts. You might argue that there are too many of them. You could also certainly make the argument that, uh, you know, there would be people better served by me making five to 10 shorter podcasts a week as like a, here's the breaking news. And as opposed to doing one three hour thing a week, but I actually really like the format of the long thing. And over the years, we've heard from so many people that have, you know, had, whether they have commutes in their lives or whatever that, you know, there's like, a, it takes them a week to listen to it anyway. And, and all that sort of stuff that, you know, the, the, the math works out on it and, and all that sort of stuff. But I, I, I believe in podcasting, but obviously that's, that's not the future. That's the now, if anything, the podcast space is only getting more cluttered and weird. Um, and the existence of big names in the podcast space, like when Conan O'Brien got into it and, and all that sort of stuff, I think made things weird when you had, uh, what the fuck the Gimlet, the, the Gimlet podcasts come up and start getting all this mainstream press. Like it used to just be, everyone just talked about Mark Marin, right? Um, and Mark Marin was the big podcast. And, uh, and then at some point it became pod bless America, whatever the it's gotten pod save America, whatever. Yeah. Um, and like all of that shit and all of the celebrity stuff that kind of like cruised in and, Carpet baggers, all of them. No, but you know, like uh, uh, the same thing happened with uh, digital music on the internet. MP3.com went through the same, the same problem, and you know, but it squeezed out a lot of the smaller independent creators because suddenly all the promotional like interest was in like, oh, Conan O'Brien's got a podcast, or this, oh, this person, you know, and and so, but I, as those celebrity podcasts come and go because they're not fucking dedicated to it the way I, I think you need to be dedicated to doing a fucking podcast. I think you got to hit your fucking marks, man. Um, and not be like, this is a six week limited run series. Like, okay, well, sure. That's not a podcast at that point. You just posted some audio somewhere. Uh, yeah. Anyway, podcasts can be a lot of different things, but, but, uh, I'm a believer in the routine of a podcast of the, it's Tuesday, and that means this podcast is here. Um, I like that. Um, and thankfully enough, people also seem to like that too. So that's why I get to keep doing this. So thanks, everybody. So uh, that's a long-winded way of saying I don't know what's next. If I knew what's next, I would be out trying to raise funding for it right now, probably or bootstrap it or, or whatever, depending on what the idea was. If it, it was a super big idea that needed funding or if it was just like, let's put together a crew and get going. Um, then, you know, I would be pushing in that direction. I'm not, I, I, I'm not, uh, the, I, I, the directions I'm pushing in right now are around being able to do more. Um, it's around uh, getting an interview podcast launched. It's around getting, um, hopefully getting moved out to the garage at some point this year uh, in a way that lets me have a larger set and do some sillier stuff there. Uh, it's around, um, it's around that sort of stuff. But then I also kind of stumbled into the NES streaming stuff and that's been so fun. Um, it's been so fun <laughs> to do that. Uh, and I did not expect that to be as fun as it is and also to do as well as it does, um, to be as, as, as liked as it is. Like I've heard from a, a lot of different people from that I, that I've known for years and stuff. And I'm like, Oh man, I started watching these. These are incredible. And like, Oh wow, that's wow. Thanks dude. That's crazy. Um, it's been very nice. It's been very nice. 
Um, but yeah, the, the goal is to get more the, right now. The, the short term goal is to get everything on a more stable schedule after having the kid and, and the, the weird health stuff that's happened and just try to get everything, uh, more resilient, I guess, uh, less, like I said, I like it when you come on a Tuesday and the podcast is there. So I, I want, you know, game boys to men to be more reliable than it has been. I want, you know, like, like reliable. And so that's why the, the pot, the, the interview podcast hasn't started is because I, I want it to make sure that that is reliable or is at least deliberately unreliable in that we're only going to do this when there are good people worth interviewing or, or whatever it is. Um, still got to think that thing through. And then it's like, should I change the names of a bunch of this? Whatever. There's a lot of branding and graphics and, I was on, I, I, I did a couple hours on uh, Vectroid's stream last week and we got to talking about stream layouts and all this stuff. And I haven't touched any of these stream layouts in like a couple of years. And, and I haven't done any, I haven't done any new graphics and I haven't gotten to anyone to, to I, I need to figure out what direction visually I want to take this stuff and then sit down and go, okay, what, what do I need? I need a logo. I need a new podcast logo. I need a stream layout that is in tune with that logo. I need basically stuff that I can, you know, th then, then that dovetails into merchandise. And then it's like, okay, we'll put this logo on a t-shirt and then we can do that. And, and you know, it's, eh. you know, I've got, you know, I've got, I, I deleted a lot of them, but I do have I guess I did delete almost all of them. I, I do have some old layouts, uh, but you know, it's right now it's just like, you know, little, well, that's just broken. We got this. Um, you know, so th like there are some layouts I've messed around with and stuff like that. But it, it really just comes down to just like, I, I need to figure out what a, like a, what deliberate direction do I want to take stuff in and, uh, visually and, and, and all that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, Steve from Minnesota writes in and says, uh, a feature I missed from the original Xbox days is the custom soundtrack option. I know only a handful of games supported it, but it was great to have your own curated lineup of songs to listen to in various racing games or his touchdown celebrations in NFL 2K5. At the time, it felt like a leap forward, and I was curious if this is a feature you had dabbled with and what your thoughts are on it today. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was really neat. Um, I didn't get to use it as much, though, because at the end of the day, reviewing games means you're reviewing the soundtracks in those games, right? And so... It led to a situation where I didn't really want to mess around with custom soundtracks too much, unless it was like a specific feature, like, oh, you can do it for touchdown dances or wrestler entrances, then you would experiment with it. But you're reviewing the soundtrack, and so I need to play the game listening to the soundtrack in order to do that. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't mess around with it all that much. I did for Burnout, I guess three and, and Revenge, I guess would have been on the original Xbox, right? Um, <clears throat> I made a soundtrack that I specifically tried to make for driving games, specifically for burnout. It is still on a, I, I eventually turned it into a Spotify playlist. Um, and it is still on there as like the ultimate driving game soundtrack or something like that. And it's, 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 a. it's, I think it's a pretty good driving game soundtrack if you, if you want that, because you know, when you go play dangerous driving that supports Spotify soundtracks but like the current playstation you can you can kind of still do the like hey listen to or even on xbox yeah i think they both have the means for you to listen to spotify while a game is running it's just a matter if the if the game's music fades out on its own or if it integrates into the game in a unique way which you know it, it kind of doesn't it just sort of plays um yeah, it's it's not the same as it was, that's for sure. I thought it was really cool, like from a just conceptual standpoint, like it, it was just a, a really neat um a really neat option. A really neat option. Alex writes in and says, What's with the Saturn's library? Yeah. 
That's the, the, the question on, on everyone's lips these days. I've been trying to get into vertical scrolling shooters and noticed that a ton of them, including some classics, like several made by Cave, were released on the Sega Saturn. Looking into the Saturn more, it got a bunch of other beloved classics, such as Panzer Dragoon Saga, Knights, hmm, Sega Rally Championship, and others. Is it just me, or is this console's library really strong for a system that in the U.S. is broadly regarded as a failure? What are your thoughts on the Sega Saturn? I think you're right. Yes, the, the the also the library of games that got released in the U.S. is uh, very different from the worldwide library. For sure, you know the the RAM cartridge. As one Dell the Funky Homo Sapien said about my man Bernie Stolar. No, um, the the RAM cartridge shipping in the U.S. would not have saved the Saturn contrary to what Dell has, has gone on record as saying. Uh, also, to wash your ass. That I do would agree with. The RAM cartridge in the U.S., no, but uh, wa washing your ass and brushing your teeth, if you must, um, that we see eye to eye on that one. All three eyes. Um, yes, the Saturn library in the U.S. was uh, was not as strong, and it was up against a surging PlayStation which, um, and, and, you know, and then eventually the N64 as well, which, you know, the, there was only so much room for conversation about games. And so the Saturn became relegated back then. Even the only people that were talking about the Saturn were people that were importing games or people that were extreme Sega fans that were holding on for dear life to whatever they could. Um, but the Saturn got beaten in the States by the PlayStation. You know, people wanted amazing 3D graphics and the Saturn was not as strong at that as the PlayStation was. Now for 2D games, the Saturn was a powerhouse. And even without the RAM cartridge in the US, we got Alpha 2 and, you know, Street Fighter the movie, Ultimate MK3, which the load times were frustrating, but you know. Uh, but we did get a handful of really good 2D games on the Saturn in the States. Um, and you know, Panzer was well regarded, but it didn't, you know, it wasn't doing so many numbers that it was, you know, competing with the PlayStation all that well, especially cause Panzer, at least the first Panzer was very early in the life cycle of the system. Um, <clears throat> so they just never had enough. You can look at individual games and, and it's easier to look at now as looking at the full li library. It's, it's easy to look at it and go, wow, this is a hell of a library, but in the U S it was all kind of spread out. It wasn't happening all at once in a way that felt like the Saturn ever had any momentum behind it. The Saturn just felt like, Oh, another game came out. And this, to me, when I think about the Saturn in the U S I think about acclaim putting out a lot of acclaims games on the Saturn NBA jam extreme, a miserable video game. Like a lot of the third party support in the U S is a lot of shitty games. Um, but you know, Hey, there are a lot of shitty games on the PlayStation as well. PlayStation just felt like it put together more bangers early on that at least stood out. And that's how they built that momentum. And then Mario 64 came out and you know, the conversation changed and like, no one was thinking about the Saturn. The Saturn was done and everyone knew it. Um, I think even, you know, as someone who has played a lot more Saturn in, in recent years than I did when it was a thing, um, when I was re reviewing Saturn games, uh, I think it's a fascinating library. A lot of really weird stuff came out in Japan that you just got overlooked and, you know, you can go back to it now and be like, oh, wow, look at this. Like there's fascinating stuff that came out on the Saturn. And so which it's a, it's a very, it's a much more interesting console in retrospect. I would say the same thing about the TurboGrafx-16. Almost the exact same thing, honestly. Like when you look at the worldwide library for that for that console and all the CD content that came out in Japan only, there are some amazing gems on that platform as well. But in terms of it competing when it was new, when it was out, when it was trying to compete with other 16-bit consoles, no one, no serious person ever looked at the Turbo Graphics and said, "This is the this is going to be the one." Like it just wasn't a thing. 
I bought my, again, I bought my turbo graphics from a flea market using money my parents had left behind for me to order food with when they left town for like a week. They went to visit my mom's parents and left me behind. And I bought a TurboGrafx 16 and a t-shirt that said, shut up, bitch, from the flea market instead of food. It was a, a smart, a, a smart purchases on both, on, on both accounts, I think. Um, hmm. Let's see if we can maybe get one or two more in here. This is just a weird, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take, we'll take these two. One's long. Ah, uh, they're both kind of long. Carlos writes in, I had an experience with a Sonic fan that made me immediately think of sending you a message about it. For context, I live in Miami and attended a techno party in a shady part of the city. For the story, I was hanging out in the backyard area of the club with some other friends when out of nowhere, we were approached by a guy in his early 20s asking us if we played Sonic. I'm a 30-year-old dude, and not once have I ever been asked this. I was thrown off by the question, but maintained my composure enough to not laugh in his face and proceeded to answer his question with the respect any Sonic fan should be expected to have. I replied with yes, with Sonic Mania being my favorite Sonic game. My first memory of Sonic was playing on the Game Gear. I asked what his favorite was, and re he replied with Sonic Generations. The rest of the conversation was thankfully brief and unremarkable. After he stepped away, I noticed he walked past another group of people hanging out, and one of them had a Shadow the Hedgehog plush doll backpack. I have never felt more lost in the world at that moment. Wow. I, um, uh, <clears throat> maybe there was a Sonic fan meetup that they decided to have at that club. And so he was just, he, he was trying to figure out if you were there as part of the meetup or not. I assume I, I, I think the idea of walking up to someone and ask, like, I, the idea of someone walking up to someone in a crowd at just a random thing and being like, Hey, do you play Sonic? I, I don't. It's frightening to me. Do you think that this guy ever found the person wearing the shadow plush doll backpack? Did they ever link up? Who can say? Who can say? I, yeah, I, I don't even know what to make of that. That's, that's just, a, that's a terrifying story on multiple levels. I, I think my only response, if, if someone walked up to me and asked me that, I think all I could really say is just like, I, uh, sure. Yeah. I've, I, I have played some Sonic games. And then if, if he asked, what's your favorite, I probably would have said Sonic the fighters, at which point he would have either, that would have been like an invite to a much larger conversation because that is a relatively obscure game or he would have run away in fear. I would have either. Yeah. I, I, like what are my favorite Sonic games? It's either Sonic the fighters or it's Sega Sonic, the hedgehog, the cool arcade game with the trackball. I think those are the only two viable answers. But I think either one of those answers would have put that guy on tilt so hard he would have not he would have not been able to handle it. Someone uttering the words Sonic the Fighters in public. <laughs> so yeah, that would have either led to a much yeah, like yes. I think the vibe of that email makes it sound like that the the writer of the email almost stumbled into some kind of furry adjacent thing. I don't know. It's like, yeah, there's a, there's some kind of yiffing vibe. I don't, anyway, do you. I like furries. I don't, Sonic fans, no, not so much. Furries are living their fucking best lives, man. Are you kidding? Truly free. 
but still somehow oppressed. Uh, Brandon from Houston writes in and says, I feel like I hear a lot of talk about layoffs in the industry and no one's talking about the real story, which is that there are too many games. And not in the, oh, we're eating good kind of way that the internet won't quit saying in the, the supply curve is way too high and the value of the industry is plummeting way. Okay, let's, this, is, this, this is a bit of a long email. Mortal Kombat 1993 came out on consoles and cost $70. Mortal Kombat 1 in 2023 came out as an exponentially bigger product and cost the same $70. Yet many criticized the game for being too expensive and not having enough content, despite being less than half the price of the original adjusted for inflation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. I suppose adjusted for inflation. It's not the, you, you have to adjust all of it and it's not the same $70, but okay. Yeah. But standards change over time. Anyway, let's go on. Let's pick three random must play titles from 2023. Spider-Man two Baldur's gate and tears of the kingdom between just those three games. We're talking 500 hours worth of game value. And we could substitute any other random titles like dead Island Two, Hogwarts legacy or any other big name games and arrive at the same conclusion. There is simply not enough hours in a human being's life to justify the number of games in the market right now and the hour count associated with each. And despite the amount of content getting astronomically higher, gamers demand prices get lower and lower as they hoard games at sale for pennies on the dollar. It feels like the overall health of the industry is getting extremely low, and with gamers having a pitchfork rebellion against games as a service, it makes no mystery why financiers would be pushing away from the table and putting their money elsewhere. I certainly would. Why would you want to put your money into a market with miserly demanding fickle customers who think their demands make sense because they pay in loyalty? In the 2000s, Nintendo said they were reticent to get into mobile because they didn't want you to contribute to the industry driving down the value of gaming. In 2024, it feels like they were right. Am I off base? So I think you are maybe right for the wrong reasons, but I do think that you are making some kind of point here as well. Um, I don't think the, I don't think the point leads to the conclusion that you're getting to, but remove the, the players and, and players buying games on sale and so on and so forth from the equation, right? We just so got the street fighter six, uh, sales story was that they just broke 3 million in six months. But remember that they sold a 2 million in the first month before the game would have been on any meaningful sale. And I don't know that it's gone on any meaningful sale since then, but it's been on more of a sale since that's month. One is two thirds of their sales. You know, the game's got a tail, but it's not necessarily, you know, selling at the same rate it did in, in, in its launch month. That's just one weird example. It's not a perfect fit, but let's, let's go with it. Right. Um, so I agree with you when you say there are not enough hours in a human being's life to justify the number of games in the market and the hour count associated with each. And this is the ultimate problem with live service games. It is not that live service games exist. It is that too many of these games exist and expect that out of the player. And, it, and as a result, I agree that that is maybe messed with player expectations a little bit in terms of how many hours they expect to get out of a game. Are they going to play a game for years or not? I think that that is a thing, but um, it's not even necessarily games that are as a service. This is some of the conversation that we had not that long ago about games like Minecraft. Um, but when we have games that can be played for thousands of hours and that are receiving updates in a way that draw you back in the way a Fortnite does the way a minecraft does terraria is still getting updates here and there i reinstalled terraria because it's a fucking amazing game um i'm not going to sink another several hundred hours into terraria at this at this point but boy i could <laughs> um and so in that world, the landscape, the competitive landscape becomes brutal, right? 
especially if you're putting out a live service game like, let's say, Suicide Squad, a game I don't know that much about because I have not played it personally, but that's the most negative batch of previews I have seen for a game in a very long time. Like, the previews hit, and all of them were just like, pfft. And I saw, you know, I, I saw a handful of, like, like, multiple discords I'm on were posting screenshots of that game and saying, look at this fucking HUD. Look at this ridiculous fucking HUD. Um, like, what the fuck are they doing? You know, like, like, really, like, kind of brutal. Even the, even the, even the previews that were like, eh, this doesn't seem very good. We're just like a real lack of benefit of the doubt, I suppose. Um. Which is what, which is why previews are rarely negative, but for a game that is shipping very soon. Um, and so they had that batch of previews and then like not long after that, they dropped the NDA and all the people that were in the alpha, I think probably hoping that some of those people would be more positive about it, but I don't think the word of mouth around that game has improved a fucking one iota. Um... I will say that all of this stuff really makes me want to play that game even more. And we were talking last week. How I'm like, I, I, I need to, I really want to see that game for myself. I'm really interested in seeing that thing. Um, now even more so I'm like, it can't possibly be, you know, like, but boy, anyway, remove that part of it. Cause we're, what we're talking about is that game as a live service for you to let that game into your life. Um, and play it for the number of hours that they would need you to play it in order for you to potentially monetize or to lead to other players also playing it. And maybe they monetize, you know, whatever for them to have this thing going for some number of years as a live service game with a, with an array of updates and so on and so forth, you need to have the time to play that, but you're already playing rocket league. You're already playing Call of Duty. You're already playing a little bit of Fortnite on the side. And then you've got games that are not necessarily live service games, but are multiplayer games that, you know, as long as your friends are playing them, you could play them for hundreds of hours too. Everyone's playing Lethal Company right now. How long will they play it? I don't know. That game is having a moment in a way that you could see it extending for a long time as long as the content is fresh. And so are those players going to play a game? Maybe they'll buy it. Maybe, you know, because God knows we're all terrible at buying games and not playing them. Diablo 4 is a great example of this, of a game that maybe isn't getting it, maybe didn't do it the right way, but also made a game that was very easy to stop playing. It's not what they wanted, but I was more than happy to stop. I was more than happy to finish that and go, I had a really good time with this and then play some more of it and being like, Ugh, I don't want to play any more of this and move on. Um, so in, in that landscape where you've got players playing all of these different games and, and, and a, a variety of games that you could play for hundreds of hours, I mean, Warframe is still getting all these updates. Warframe is doing major things still after all these years in a different era, all of those Warframe players would have played Warframe for however long dark sector was five hours, eight hours, whatever. And then they would have gone and bought another $60 game, 70, whatever. But now they're still playing Warframe instead of buying another game. And the, yeah, long tail gaming. If we, yeah. We, if we want to call it that, but the, the live service game, but it, it's, it's more than just live service games. So you can't really just call it that because you wouldn't Minecraft. You could technically call it a live service game in a way, I guess, but it's not, it's not the same vibe. It's not the same. It's not accurate, really. Games that are frequently updated, multiplayer experiences, um, what have you, are inspiring players. They are desperately, they're, they're talking in monthly active users now, the same way mobile games do, right? And that's, that's, that, that's the metric. It's not about how many millions of copies did you sell. Like, it, that matters. But it's also how many people are still playing this so that we can... How many skins should we sell? How many skins can we make? How many, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do here? How much more money can we make? You know, like, like by, by supporting this game and it's not always a bad thing. You know, you're supporting a game that people are playing that people want to keep playing by putting new content in it. 
Those people are being super served in some cases by some of these games. But uh, then you look at Rumbleverse shutting down in six months or, or whatever, whatever the, the final number actually was. You know? You look at the body count of games that came you look at marvel's avengers and you know these games have problems on their own right it is, it, you, you can't just go like oh poor this game it just got eaten up by the landscape like you know in a lot of cases like the games have issues that prevented them from catching on to a degree that helped them penetrate into that space but uh yeah multiverses for example that's a game that just had a bunch of issues that avengers game you know had yes had large problems um, as just a, a game before anyone knew if it was going to be a success or a failure as a long-term live game, I played that game when it first came out and was like, this has a really good story mode. And then everything they have after that is boring as shit. And then they said, we're going to solve this problem by making it take longer to level up your characters. Also, you can't just play any character you want in a multiplayer game. You can only have one of each character. Like, Okay. You want to sell skins for a game and then you're not even going to let me use that character? What is this, Call of Duty? No, um, so I, I think that the landscape for that stuff is brutal and that didn't exist in 1993. You know? Um, if it did, it existed because f multiplayer fighting games were such a big deal that you might have said, oh, we're not going to go buy these run-of-the-mill platformers anymore because we're still playing Mortal Kombat 2. You know? Um, I'm sure that there was some... You could probably do some math there. But, like, yeah. I mean, you know, look at Fortnite. Look at how big Fortnite is. Fortnite just added fucking four more games, three more games, whatever it is. And put those out for free, too, because they're confident they can make it up on the back end selling songs. And because you can use those songs in the Battle Royale, now they make amazing taunts. And now you just see videos on TikTok of people playing fucking Weezer songs in the middle of Fortnite and then shooting people afterwards. And you're like, this is great. It's great that they added this. It's the end of the world in some way or another. Um, but what a neat addition for a fucking really, what, what an incredibly bizarre video game. Fortnite is maybe the weirdest game in the world. If you really extrapolate it and break it down to the, the pathway that that game has taken through the market from what it started as to what it became to them saying, actually, we're going to even take the building out. The thing that was part of you, the base building stuff you did in Save the World that we kept for our Battle Royale game. Actually, we're going to take that out too for a separate mode that now everyone's into. Except for pro players who... I. I was watching Ninja get a low taper fade the other day. And there was another video of him complaining about uh, how the only way to do well in the building variant of Fortnite is to move so you live somewhere where you get a lower ping. <laughs> that like the high level Fortnite play with building in it is so bizarre. Is so fucking crazy that like that is the that that is the way to succeed is to live somewhere where you get a zero ping. And maybe that was just him complaining because like I where I live I got a thirty ping I'm not gonna play I'm not gonna build fuck it. So I don't know maybe that's uh maybe that's just Ninja's problem. But he did get that haircut from the song and congratulations to him. Um. So yeah, I, I think that I, I think all of those things uh, are are knock on effects of of you know that make it harder for games to sell, especially if there are games that are trying to ask hundreds of hours of you. If it's a game that's coming out and saying like, hey, this is, here's a five hour game, like that's a much easier. Like Prince of Persia is is coming out this week, or it's I guess it's out now if you're paying extra for it or 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 a subscriber to their service or, or whatever the the deal is. Um, that's a game you can just play it and finish it and move on to the next thing. So, and that's a very easy game to fit in between battle passes and Fortnites and, and call it, you know, whatever. But to come out and say, like, Suicide Squad seems like, I, between those previews and I think just the general vibe around, like, here's another live service game that we're going to want you to play for, like, to devote some percentage of your gaming life to. 
I don't think people are ready to do that. I think the the bar for that is super high right now in terms of g games of that sort. Um, and so I think shipping a new one, I, I, we'll see how it goes, man. That could be a fucking bloodbath. That could be absolutely brutal, uh, for, for Suicide Squad, for Rocksteady, for Warner, whatever. Um, we'll see. They're starting to market the shit out of it. It feels like it's, it feels like it's on both wrestling programs. So take that how you will, but, uh. I'll be really curious to see how Suicide Squad does when it comes out. Um, like I said, I have to know. I really want to play that game. I really want to see what that game is all about. I don't know anything about the Suicide Squad or who was in it. Samoa Joe does a voice. I, got, I don't know. Like, who, is, who is a Suicide Squad guy? Will Smith, right? He was in that movie, right? I didn't see the movie either. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know anything about the fucking Suicide Squad. Um, so, but, but I'm still just like, I have to know, I have to know that's not a recommendation on my part that you should do the same. In fact, I will play it when I can and, uh, and let you know, <laughs> uh, anyway, that's going to do it for us here. I'm still on this camera. I forgot. Hi. We're outside. It's windy out here. Have a good uh, rest of your week. Be back to do some more video gaming, I suppose. And then on Friday, of course, we'll rank some more 8-bit Nintendo games. Head over to the Patreon. Get access to the latest Jeff Gerstmann Hall of Fame. Access to the latest Game Boys to Men. And so on and so forth. Uh, take care of yourselves. And the podcast will be back next Tuesday. I'll see you then. Bye.